we don't have all of our members here yet, and I have been advised by a couple of the board member offices uh, that they will be a little delayed in arriving, but we, it does appear that we have a quorum uh, here today to do business, so if staff could help us uh, establish a quorum by calling the roll, we can go ahead and uh, get started. Okay, Senator Lowenthal? Here. Assemblymember Fuller? Here. Assemblymember Brownlee? Here. Scott Harvey? Present. Dr. William Ellerby? Here. Rosario Gerard? Here. Tom Sheehy? Uh, here. We do have a quorum. Okay, great. Thank you, Lisa. Um, uh, just a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, we're not going to be able to mm -hmm. approve the minutes today. I'm sure you're all terribly disappointed to hear that. Uh, our transcriber wasn't able to get them to us in time for the meeting. So if there's no objection from the board members, I think we're going to have the February 25th minutes approved at our next meeting. And also, we had a request this afternoon by Senator Gloria Romero to enter a letter into the record. Mm -hmm. And this, was, this is a letter that all the board members will get, but it's a letter commending the board for uh, its decision to have its meetings broadcast live via webcast, which we can thank, among other people, the Department of General Services and Mr. Harvey helping to facilitate. And staff, if you could take this letter and have it entered into the mm -hmm. uh, record, Lisa, into today's record, I'm sure that Senator Romero would very much appreciate that. Mr. Harvey. Well, as a tag to that, I did want to confirm that uh, this is literally the first meeting that is going to be webcast, and I want to thank those in DGS who made it possible. It is something we are starting with uh, on audio and uh, uh, visual. We ultimately hope to have it interactive over time. But it's, I think, a wonderful statement of transparency, and I want to thank the board members for uh, agreeing that this was a good idea. But we are doing it today, live, real time. Let the record show that the board approved this despite Mr. Harvey's strong support of the measure. <laughs> okay, uh, Mr. Cook, we don't have the minutes. What shall uh, we move to first? Can you uh, help us? Uh, to the executive officer's statement. Okay, thank you, Rob Cook. Very briefly. I um, wanted to give the board members a, an update on the pool money investment board, but uh, some good news that we've, that we've recently gotten. Um, now, at the last pool money investment board, uh, the board voted to authorize up to $500 million for all the infrastructure programs, not this one in specific, but all the infrastructure programs, upon the successful sale of $4 billion in bonds. Uh, I'm very pleased to announce that the Treasurer has been more than successful and um, has been successful in selling, I believe the number is $6.5 billion in bonds. And so over the next several days, we will be uh, getting a, an idea of how much will be available to this program out of that. Note, noting, please, that there is a substantial portion of that that has to go back to paying back loans beforehand, but there should be some money available to this program so that we can help take care of some of those projects that are that are in our backlog. Um, so that's some good news. Uh, I'll let I, you will be the first to know how good the news is when when uh, we get that information. Uh, also, uh, I want to thank the Department of Finance, uh, Dep uh, Department of Education, and the State Treasury uh, Controller's Office in helping us transfer fifty million dollars from the Prop 98 reversion account to our emergency repair program. That transaction occurred last night and everybody came together and we were able to affect it. So next month we will be able to fund emergency repair projects at, uh, at our April board. So with that, I conclude. Um, if it pleased the members of the board, I would be happy for one moment to change hats to my finance hat if you like and just add a few more uh, pieces of information to Mr. Cook's report on the bonds. Would that please the board? Okay. Um, I wouldn't want to just add to Mr. Cook's report that, um, first of all, I think that H.D. Uh, Palmer, Department of Finance, was quoted in the papers today as complimenting the treasurer, and I would like to really amplify that by saying, you know, we're all extremely pleased uh, with the work by the state treasurer's office and uh, Bill Lockyer, Treasurer Bill Lockyer, uh, they really exceeded everybody's expectations. I think the treasurer's office going in thought they'd sell four billion dollars in bonds, and in fact, they sold six and a half. So that's really, really good news uh, for 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 us. 
and for uh, everybody that is interested in the state bond program and public works program. So uh, we're still sorting out the details, but we believe what this means is that it will in fact allow the treasurer controller, they'll allow the pooled money investment board to pay off $3.8 billion in PMIB loans uh, and also to cover the costs of the projects that we exempted. There were originally 276 projects that were exempted uh, from the freeze in December and some of those were school construction projects. Many of those were not school construction projects. But those projects have continued in many cases haven't received an, a, a dime uh, of bond money because we haven't had any to allocate. So now that they, because they have been accepted and they've continued to do that work, we're in a position now to pay some of those bills. Uh, we also believe that we'll be in a position to repay a portion of the bills for work previously done, uh, but which hasn't been paid. That clearly includes some of the work in the school facilities program. We're all uh, in, in, in Department of Finance, we're very much aware of the $1.3 billion in requests for fund releases, which we've not been able, which the pooled money investment board has not been able to release funds on due to the freeze. And um, uh, I'm not saying to, I don't know, the, on it, the, the most direct, frank answer is today, I don't know how much of that we can chip away at, but I'm quite sure based upon the treasurer's sale that we will in fact be able to chip away at it in a very meaningful way. And I think that, you know, as, as, uh, as finance continues to work with the pooled money investment board, you know, one of the things that's going to continue to focus on in looking at how these resources can be allocated to the highest good will be to continue to look at things like critical safety, uh, health and public safety issues, uh, the creation of jobs, shovel-ready projects, uh, reimbursing work that's already been done and commitments that have already been made, and uh, also trying to see in whatever ways that we can address things like uh, address issues associated with the drought that we're facing and our water conditions. So the picture uh, is still evolving. Uh, the treasurer is going to go back to market next month uh, and sell uh, taxable bonds. And uh, that's going to be important to a whole other class of folks. And at the same time that he's selling taxable bonds, he's going to be selling another bond that's been made available through the Obama administration uh, uh, stimulus program. These are called the Build America bonds. Now, the Build America bonds hold special, uh, I'm advised by my colleagues who know more about this than I do, the Build America bonds have uh, 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 special attention to them right now. We're looking at them because they are bonds that are marketed and sold as taxable bonds, but in fact, we can use them for tax-exempt purposes. And of course, the school facilities program is funded with tax-exempt bonds. And the key thing about these Build America bonds is since they uh, can be sold in the taxable market, it gives us uh, more options for selling bonds. In other words, the large institutional pension funds that normally wouldn't buy our tax-exempt bonds because they don't have a high enough yield, they may in fact be interested in some of these Build America bonds. And the good news for the state is, is that the federal government will actually rebate back to us 35% of the interest costs, making them to us and cost look like a tax-exempt bond. So, you know, we don't have a crystal ball and we don't know what the Treasurer will be able to do next month, but we're encouraged uh, by our financial advisors that these Build America bonds will have a wider market than some of our other options. And if the treasurer is as successful next month as he was this month, then it, it seems logical to assume that we'll be able to chip away even further uh, in a significant way towards the backlog on all of these projects. So with that, uh, I've, I've pretty much exhausted my knowledge, but I'd be happy to take questions from members of the board. Senator Lowenthal. Uh, <clears throat> do we have a, a clear picture, I think you mentioned a little over 1.3 billion, of all the projects, school facility projects that we have not been able to fund either uh, in total, because we, we talked about the 276, there are a portion of that 276, and then there are others also. I think there was over, at one time I thought 5,000 that they were, how many are school construction and do we know the total amount, if we were able to totally fund everything? Mr. Cook, can you, uh, can you help answer uh, Senator Lowenthal's question? Um, there are fi five um, health and safety projects on that list. There, there was, uh, there's actually more than that. There, there are quite a few health and safety projects that are in the school facility area, but many of those were actually conceptually approved by this board, not actually finally approved by this board, so they're not eligible for funds yet. There are five projects, um, five projects that were fully approved by this board that are on that exemption list. Uh, 
I know the dollar figure for a few of them, but I don't recall the full dollar figure for all of them. Um, that that if if those projects can receive funding, um, that, and then I said there are five five projects. Uh, I think the largest of which is a thirteen or sixteen million dollar project. But isn't it so true? That's total. It's just of all the projects that are on that list, the th the, there's just five that are school construction projects, or just the health and safety. There of the group of projects that were exempted by the pool money investment board by for the from the freeze right there were a group of health and safety projects they were all, all school facility program projects what uh, about the ones that are not health and safety are there others that were there it, it was strictly health and safety projects that were approved for exemption okay so there are no other projects that were not funded is what you're saying there in, I, I'm just wondering how many projects are out there waiting for for us to sell the bonds. Oh, there's, there. In fact, in your in your book today, there is a that list exists oh, in your book today, uh, and we will get to it when we uh, we okay. deal with the funding priority issue. But it's an extensive list. It shows every single project that has been approved. Right. Not a that's portion. what I'm. Uh, that that is uh, Rob. For the record, could you just take an estimate of how many hundreds of projects that is? Because I think it's 848 projects. Is that 800 school districts? 848 involved. projects. Is right. that 848 roll up to the 2.4 billion dollars in apportionments? That's correct. Okay, so 840 projects, 2.4 billion dollars. That's correct. Okay, and uh, and that involves 250 school districts. Overall. Okay, and and we're expecting to get then out of the 840 about six seven hundred of those about two billion dollars is that it? Well, I didn't, uh, Senator Lowenthal. I, <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, I purposely didn't go Mr. there. Mr. Harvey said so. He I, told me that you'd get that. Well, my my colleague can speak for himself, <laughs> but I I purposely didn't go there because I don't want to give out bad information. No, I understand. And I'm uh, just just yeah. really encouraging. You know, as we this board has just and we know that. You know that you will be our, you know that you understand the needs anyway of of, of the school construction. So um, I know that that's been a topic of a lot of interest, uh, Ms. Brownlee. Yeah. So of the five uh, exempted projects, though, they come first. They're the first in the queue. That's a well. Yeah, I'll let Tom handle so, that one. So. Uh, so as w what we did is, is we said that since we exempted those projects, the, the first call on the money is, is to get all those, to, get, to pay the exempted projects for the work that has been done, that they haven't been paid for, and to uh, pay them at least through the first half of the uh -huh. 910 fiscal year. Since we've exempted them, we got to pay them. Right. Uh, so that would be the first call on the money. But then there'll be additional funds that will be available beyond that to help pay for work that's already been completed uh, by other entities that weren't on the exemption list. For example, there are a number of school projects where uh, all the necessary contracts were let and they were ready to come in for fund releases, but we weren't, they weren't able to get a fund release because of the freeze. Because of the bond sales, we would now be able to address part of that population. Okay. And, and then there's other projects like uh, uh, in, in other areas, it, there's, there's uh, transportation projects, there are water projects, there are multifamily housing projects and so on and so forth that are in a similar situation that we need to uh, pay bills for work that's already been done. And uh, so, you know, we're going to chip away at that with this money that we have and then hopefully make more progress next month. Okay. And so if we, um, I know nobody here has a crystal ball, but if we, there's authorization for 500 million, we're going to get a per certain percentage of that, I would presume. I mean, maybe we get zero percent. I guess that is an outcome that could happen. Is that a question? Um, yes, that is a question. Uh, you know, uh, I, I, I don't know exactly what's going to happen, but I know what the sort of the general <coughs> uh, framework is here. And the framework is to make significant payments on the exempted projects. We, remember, we've got $2.5 billion here. No, and, I understand. And, and to make uh, significant payments to repay a portion of the bills for work previously done, and and that clearly includes schools, and also um, you know we want to continue to you know when we when we look at what our other options are we want to continue to focus on critical health and safety projects, job creation, our ability to capture federal stimulus dollars, um, you know if there's things that we can do in the water area to deal specifically with things like drought, 
uh, these are things that we're going to continue to look at. But, you know, we're still analyzing exactly sort of where all the pieces I, I, I think, I guess, you know, the message is while we want to be as aggressive as we can about getting as much money as we can around these projects, I, th I think the message is, is that probably um, most of this money is going to kind of backfill loans and that there's not going to be that many projects that get funded um, from this. So yes, we're talking about a lot of good news in terms of the amount of bonds um, being sold. That is really good news, but it's not, uh, nobody should walk away from here thinking it's really good news that, you know, hundreds of projects are going to get funded because that's not the case. And it's probably, you, you know, if we're lucky, it might be 10 projects that are funded um, <coughs> or uh, some paid that, that needed to get paid and shored up. <coughs> but in terms of kind of new things down the road that are in that queue, anyway, I just wanted to get make that message. Well, I'm glad that you delivered that message and not me. But, but, but to put that in better perspective, you're absolutely Time I can be the, you know, your messenger, I'm happy <laughs> to put that in better perspective, you know, you're absolutely right. We have $7.3 billion in loans that the Treasurer needs to pay off, and this is only going to pay off a portion of them. So everything you said comports with exactly the situation we're facing. In all seriousness, I'm, I'm glad you raised that subject. I, you know, we, we, we are working very closely with the Treasury and the Comptroller to figure out to make every dollar available we can. But they had $7.3 billion in loans that were outstanding. And uh, they needed to get as much of that paid off as possible to make the pool solvent. So you're absolutely right. And I'm. What I don't understand, then, if I might, it, it, there's seven, how much money in loans? 7.3 uh, 7 7 .3 billion. And they sold six. Uh, tell me, and they sold 6.56 billion. Does that mean that we're getting close, or is there just less than a, or is there other money, other call on that money? Are you talking about that we're really only short now, somewhere around 700 million dollars, or are you saying? Well, that's an excellent question, uh, Senator. I'm glad you asked it. Um, the there's. There's three types of debt that exist to the pooled money investment account, as I understand it from the experts at the State Treasury's office. They had uh, 3.8 billion in debt uh, that was for tax exempts. Mm -hmm. So this sale that they are in the process of completing, and the sale will be actually completed next week, was the sale of tax exempt bonds. Right. So that's so it. the so the maximum amount they could reimburse the pool for the tax exempts was 3.8 billion because that's what the outstanding liability right. was. So since they sold 6.5, they, they had enough, they have enough to not only reimburse the 3.8 tax exempts, but to also have an additional 2.5 or what, 2.7 right. billion to fund all these other priorities that we've been talking about. But then they also have other debts to the pool for taxable bonds. And so when he goes, when the treasurer goes to market next month, he'll have <coughs> another target he's trying to hit on taxable bonds. And if he, if he, if he hits that level in taxable bonds, then he can fully, fully repay the pool with that, and anything over that will then be available for additional projects that can be funded with taxables. In addition, they have uh, 1.3 billion, as I understand it, in commercial paper <coughs> that needs to be repaid with bond proceeds, and I, I'm not certain, but I think those also have to be repaid with taxables. So there's these different types of debt that exist to the pool, and the sale that, that they're in the process of uh, finishing this month will fully reimburse the pool for all the debt that existed in the tax exempt category. Uh, but then we'll have to see how he does next month with the taxables. Okay. And as far as I know, the school facilities program uh, state <laughs> bonds are funded primarily with tax exempt bonds. Isn't that right, Rob? Yeah, exclusively. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, and I'd mentioned the Build America bonds because. Those bonds that he'll be selling next month along with the taxables, those are sold to the same market as the taxable markets, but the Build America bonds can, in fact, be used for tax-exempt projects. And so the advantage to us is, is that they'll have a wider market they can be sold to, which theoretically will give us a better opportunity to sell, but then those proceeds we can actually use for tax-exempt projects. And the, and, the cr and the key element of the Build America bonds, bonds the key policy element with the Obama administration is they want that money to be used for projects that will last a long time, that will have a long uh, uh, a life cycle. And clearly, new school construction would have a long life cycle and would be a good candidate for those bonds. So, you know, we're, we're hopeful that uh, 
you know, that as we move forward that that, in fact, will be a successful program. Yes, Mr. Uh, I apologize for coming in late. Uh, you happen to be talking about something that is uh, very uh, uh, important to me, and uh, that's why I've been bringing it up. So I apologize if I, if I ask you to repeat. My understanding is the bond sale they completed today, uh, they intended for it to be $4 billion. Uh, interest was so great that it's $6 billion. 6.5. 6.5, which I will say sort of underscores the point I've been making. Uh, and as a matter of fact, I did talk to brokers today, and they said they could have sold more. So that, that's what the demand is. And if you look at it historically, uh, with the 30-year bonds, I think we're out to a little bit over 6%. Uh, you can go back like 15 years or so when that was, that was very common. So. I think that's a good thing. But the part that, that I want to make sure I understood you s to say is that money would repay those funds in the, in the pooled money investment uh, fund. Does that mean then, what does that mean for us in terms of getting money for these projects? Sure, um, Senator Weiland. Uh, the, uh, the, the pooled money investment account uh, has $3.8 billion in loans outstanding that would need to be repaid with the proceeds of tax-exempt bonds. So uh, as I understand it from the Treasurer's Office, the first $3.8 billion in the sales, therefore, would be used to replenish the, the pooled money investment account. And that's important because the Treasurer hasn't been to market since June of 08. And of course, with our cash situation, that's what got us into the freeze in the first place. But above that, you know, you've got another $2.7 billion in bonds above that which then gives us the ability to address some of our needs. And you know, we, we have needs for the projects that got exempted. Uh, we have needs to pay their cash requirements through the end of the current fiscal year and to pay their cash requirements on into the next fiscal year. We have needs to uh, make payments on projects that had already had work completed but hadn't gotten reimbursed at the time the freeze happened. Some of those include school facilities. Some of those include other types of projects. So we need to uh, make progress on paying the bills for work that's already been done. And uh, we, don't have a f uh, you know, we don't have a spreadsheet that sort of lays all this out. We're still, you know, the dust is sort of, s sort of still settling here. Then we have a little on this one that, that we handed that has two point, I think $1.1 $1 .1 billion in contracts that are under contract and uh, under construction and under contract. And that's I'm sorry, Senator Lowenthal. The, uh, I think I, I have that they were of school facilities. There was $1.1 billion that were under contract and under construction. Yes, I, I think Rob Cook can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that we had $1.3 billion in requests for fund releases based mm -hmm. upon apportionments that this body had made, but for which we haven't been able to make those fund releases. Is that right, Rob? Uh, that's correct. Uh, so does that mean uh, if it's one3 that excess money, it's, it's finance that is going to make, to go back, that is going to make the determination as to where the money goes. Is well, actually, uh, as, uh, as I had commented uh, in, uh, on several uh, public meetings, uh, the Department of Finance welcomes uh, the policy input from this body if, in fact, we don't have $1.3 billion in funds to fully f release to fully satisfy the one point, if, if there's not enough money at this particular point in time to fully satisfy the full $1.3 billion in fund releases that we know there's demand for, and it's some lower number, then therefore there'll have to be a, priori there'll have to be a prioritization. And uh, I, I have said uh, in, in, in my role here that uh, and because I have this dual role of finance that we welcome the State Allocation Board's policy on that. I know there's been quite a bit of discussion in the Implementation Committee about this. I don't, I don't, maybe we'll hear a report later today, I think it's on our agenda, how much progress they've made. Uh, but we would welcome uh, the input. We wouldn't just welcome, we would in fact accept well. the recommendation from the State Allocation Board. But if you're asking me, Mr. Weiland, if, if I think we'd be able to, in one fell swoop, take care of all 1.3 billion, the direct answer is I don't know, so I can't I can't answer that because I don't know. So, I guess what I'm saying is the amount left over after the 
billion, uh, which replaces, replenishes those funds, uh, will be more than 1.3. Yes. And someone somewhere in the administration is going to make a call. Well, as I said before, <laughs> as I said before, the first call on mm -hmm. it, the very first call on that money that's left over, is going to be to cover the exempt projects because they got an exemption four months ago from the freeze. And they have, that work has been continuing and no payments have been made. None of those contractors, in many cases, contractors have been using their own money. Some of the transportation projects have had to do some fancy footwork to find other fund sources. There have been all sorts of different you know, methods used that I'm not even aware of to try to keep some of these projects going, probably with bailing wire and bubble gum. So the, f the first call on those funds is going to be to make payments on the projects that were exempted. S there are a small handful of those that are school projects. They were health and, health and safety. Beyond that, we need to repay as much of the bills as we can for work that's already been done. Bills have been submitted, but we haven't made any payments. That includes a number of different types of public works projects, many of which are school projects, but not all of which are. So, you know, the, the process that we're looking at is for paying for the projects that were exempted and for paying for projects for which the work has already been completed but for which we haven't paid. And we're going to pay off as much of that as we possibly can and we're going to continue to focus on things like critical health and safety projects, jo projects that will result in immediate jobs that are shovel ready, projects that will capture federal funds and stimulus funds. We're going to continue to do everything we can, but the reality is, is that, you know, the treasurer sold 6.5, he didn't sell 16.5. So, there, you know, not every single need is going to get met immediately. We're going to, we're going to keep our fingers crossed that the treasurer will be just as successful next month as he was this month, and that'll give us a greater ability to address more of these needs. Well, I, I guess what I'm saying is I hope, I, what you're saying makes absolute sense. Uh, our other projects, I'm sure in all of our districts, I've got transit projects that I'd also like to see get money, some of which are underway. Uh, I just hope that we can weigh, <coughs> weigh in on that process. In terms of the $1.3 billion, do we know how much in addition to that we owe uh, the, the money you're talking about that we actually owe? I, I, I'm not sure quite how to characterize it, money that we have not uh, we have not paid, uh, and, and, and if I know, can, we yeah, owe. Yeah, if, well, uh, if I can address that. The board has allocated uh, about $2.4 billion to approximately 848 projects out there uh, in about 250 different school districts that we cannot yet release funds to. Uh, one point, just short of $1.4 billion of those have actually come in and, and met all the requirements for fund release, including that they've got their contracts in place. So um, the overall, if you're, if you're asking what's the pool, what's the backlog, it's $2.4 billion altogether. Well, I, I guess what I'm trying to determine and what I heard uh, Mr. Sheehy talking about, if I understood it correctly, is money we already owe. Uh, and we owe it, in, I know, in transportation projects that had to stop and in school projects, if, and, and maybe we don't know that, but if we could get that money, which obviously should be the number one priority, uh, if we could get a number there, I think it'd be helpful. I, I think the right number there is the 1.3 uh, in requests for fund releases. That's, I believe that's the, and, right and that, that's and the short answer for that. And, and when you say for fund releases, they've already started. They all, every single one of those projects has their contracts in place. Many of them ha have proceeded. I couldn't tell you how many of them. Um, we, we have that information. I can't tell you how many of those okay, have proceeded. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. I just, I, I just think it's important because I think what Mr. Shi is saying is we know there's transportation projects that shut down. And I th understand what he's saying is, and I think it'd be the true of, of schools, at least we should get th that money. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Harvey. Uh, I have a perhaps good story to tell, and there's another category of projects that are not dependent on school money to proceed, and those are projects that are fully funded because they have no need for state bond money. They have all of their funding locally, or they may have funding uh, 
uh, from the Fed stimulus that comes directly to them. They may be looking to get our state money at a later date, but there are a category of projects that are shovel ready now and can go. And I am aware that the uh, state architect is looking at mechanisms and techniques and authorities that would allow him to move those projects through the system so that we again have more school projects built, not waiting for action by someone else. They're ready to go. We can be of assistance. And I think that is a good story that needs to be told as well. Is, are you talking about those that have not, already not yet been apportioned that, that, that don't need money? Correct. They are, they are perhaps uh, at, the, at the DSA in a, as an application. They haven't come to us gotcha. for apportionment. They don't need an apportionment. They just need to be approved. Do we need to approve those if they don't need an apportionment? Uh, I, I was told we do not, so that uh, the, the architect's stamp on it and their validation that they're shovel ready could mean that they could start within 30 days. Uh, is it possible to get a list of those projects? I'm sure we can share that list with you, Senator, when uh, the architect has developed it. I'm sure he's doing his due diligence now to try to identify those, call those out, and we'll be happy to make that a public pronouncement when okay. it's available. And then that's the last stop is the state architect. For those categories For of those projects. Categories. Um, are there other members that uh, have questions? Um, I'm going to put my, uh, I'm going to take my Department of Finance hat off now and return back to just being a member of the State Allocation Board. Uh, Mr. Cook, where are we? <laughs> well, that was quite a warm up to the consent agenda, so uh, that, I think that's where we are. Um, okay, so can you take us, is there anything we need to discuss on the consent agenda, Mr. Cook? Uh, if, if no members have any issues with the items on the consent agenda, it's ready for your, for a motion and approval. We're on tab four. There, there weren't any, are there any requests of any members of the board to remove <coughs> any items from the consent agenda today? There's nothing controversial on there, is there, Rob? Nope, not that I'm aware of. Okay. Um, Seeing no requests uh, to remove any items from the consent agenda, uh, is there a motion to approve? So moved. We have a, we have a motion by Mr. Harvey, a second by Mr. Rard. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Nobody's opposed. Okay, the consent <laughs> calendar is approved. Excuse me. All right, um, financial reports. The next item is behind tab five. Um, page 63 in your agenda, and it's the status of funds. Uh, the board just approved unfunded approvals for new construction, 23.4 million and 16.2 in modernization. Um, there will be an item presented in the consent special section um, totaling 8.3, and from um, Proposition 1D, it remains 3.8 billion available for the board. There were some um, funds captured through rescission and closeout in Proposition 55, totaling 14.9 million, leaving 551.7 million uh, available to the board. In Prop 47, some minor adjustments, totaling um, a balance remaining of 934.5. On the following page, you can see there that there still remains 22.3 million available in Proposition 1A with a grand total of 5.38 uh, billion <coughs> available to the board once we have the um, ability to make apportionments. The, in the consent section, there was also 5.1 million and unfunded approvals for the emergency repair program. And as Rob mentioned earlier, we will bring those projects back for funding in the following uh, board in April. And um, that concludes the status of funds. The fund releases on the following page haven't moved yet uh, in accordance to our conversation earlier today. Okay, thank you, Ms. Morgan. Do we have any questions of the board members of Ms. Morgan on the financial report? Okay. Seeing none, we're going to move on to consent specials. We have three items today on consent special, and uh, I am going to ask uh, that item number seven, tab number seven, which is Lammersville, that that be, that we do a roll call vote on that one. But if it's okay with the board members, we can uh, uh, do a, a unanimous vote if there's no objection. 
on tab number six and number eight after staff describes what they are. Um, on and I'm just asking for a roll call vote because I'm going to abstain on tab number seven. If it pleases the board, on behind tab six on page 66 is a um, conceptual approval for rehabilitation for the Pacific Unified uh, School District. Um, it's a health and safety project um, regarding some uh, structural issues and um, their um, energy systems. This is an estimated cost once uh, the project does come forward of just under 500 um, million and we would ask that the board approve the recommendations as outlined on page 67. Question or comments on uh, tab number six Pacific Unified staff is recommending approval of the district's request. Mr. Weiland. Uh, I want to make sure I, I think you just misspoke you said 500 million you mean 500,000. Oh. Yes thank okay. you. All right. <laughs> Ms. Morgan, Ms. Morgan, just because That's a lot of energy. Just because we sold a lot of bonds, don't get carried away. Well, there's 19 children there. I just wanted to just get them a little extra money. Sorry about that. Okay. I, so, no, seeing no other questions on tab number six, can you please present number seven? Um, yes. Uh, under tab seven is a is a funding item for Lammersville Elementary. As you may recall, at the uh, <coughs> at our February board, the a, an, a, an appeal was heard on this item. The uh, the board ap approved the appeal. This is the funding. Uh, this is the funding item, or I'm actually, funded. it's it's an unfunded approval since we don't actually have um, cash in the accounts at the moment. But it's an unfunded approval for this project, um, and it would be in the an estimated amount of 8.3 million. Um, we had to do an estimated amount because we ac haven't actually had an opportunity to process the full application yet. Are there questions uh, regarding uh, tab number seven? Okay, let's go on to tab number eight, then we'll take a vote, then we'll approve these. <clears throat> yes, on tab number eight, that's the transfer of the critically overcrowded school program. It's a follow up to the discussion that we had at the last board. <laughs> and consistent with the conversation that took place and the direction provided by the board, the recommendations outlined on page 71 authorizes the transfer of 700 million from the critically overcrowded schools account to the new construction funds and that will be moved on an as needed basis for projects um, that when the actual transfer of the funds will occur. Consistent with the board's direction, 140.7 has been held back um, for a period of three months, and at which time we'll bring back another item for uh, discussion and consideration by the board. We will also um, be sure that we carefully review the applications and fund them, uh, process them for unfunded approvals in accordance to whether or not they have a labor compliance program so that, that they're um, authorized out of the appropriate pot of money um, at at a certain point we will have exhausted the proposition 1d authority and so we make sure that we go on record that that districts need to be aware that there is a potential when we only have proposition 47 and 55 monies available that they would be required by law to have a labor compliance program consistent with the conversation that took place at the last board uh, we will put out mass mailers to all of the districts and post this information on our website so we include that in our recommendations um, <coughs> today before you for the board's consideration okay so miss morgan if i understood you correctly then this 140 million dollar reservation we would come back and address in the june meeting is that right yes okay mr duffy did you want to address the board Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. Tom Duffy for cash. Just uh, we talked about this topic uh, two weeks ago. Um, we expressed uh, two concerns. One was the, uh, the the intent of the use of the funds, and we we really have have seen new construction as as being the the major area. Although, as I pointed out to you, the the term new construction in in the appropriate code section is a small n and a small c. Um, what 
our concern is that you, you uh, if you make, if you take action to move these, these funds, we believe that you would not have any authority to retrieve funds from, from the, the category of new construction. I do not know at this time what the implications are for labor compliance, but as uh, we shared with you at the last board meeting, you may have a means of addressing this through your staff that could be simple and not complicate what goes on with funding sources and, and the, the commingling of dollars that have a labor compliance requirement and those that do not. So uh, I, I don't see, and we don't see the, the urgency to move forward at this time. You're not making real apportionments. You still have a good deal of money left in the, the Proposition uh, 55 new construction category. Could we relax this and, and take a look at what the implications are for it and, and bring it back at the next time? We have not had an opportunity to really dialogue with your staff. This was only two weeks ago. And so we're, we're asking uh, for your patience with, with us and with this and just say, don't, don't do this at this time. We, uh, we have others that we are dialoguing with uh, about these funds. There's a good deal of concern about what will happen with the, the uh, eventual uh, exhaustion of the Prop uh, 55 new construction funds wow. and that whole question of, of level three, something that, that Cash has said over and over again we think is, is complicated and, and we're, we're not anxious to get there, but we think that we want to make sure that all that you know and all that we know is all that we can know about what could happen with these funds. Thank you, Mr. Duffy. You know, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't say I'm just completely perplexed with your testimony today. Um, you know how highly I think of you, um, and I'm sure you're aware of the fact that we've got over $800 million in workload right now for new construction, uh, but we've only got $499 million actually available to address it. So I'm, 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 I'd be happy to go along with the majority of the members of this board if they'd like to delay this action, but I'm, I'm really quite taken aback uh, that uh, Cash's position would be with only $499 million available that we wouldn't want to transfer uh, the $800 million, uh, to transfer the funds from the critically overcrowded school program right now when we have uh, almost twice that amount of workload on the books, and this clearly could address that. So I'm, I feel like I'm, I'm taking a bit, uh, 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 this ca clearly catches me off guard. Uh, I just would have assumed it would have been a natural decision for everybody to want to get this money into the new construction where we have far more need right now than resources available. And I'm, uh, I'm actually quite surprised at your testimony today, Mr. Harvey. Sure, that's that's kind of consistent with my concern, but I articulated it differently last month, and that was it has been my interest all along to have as much money in the new construction category that, as you've articulated. And I was troubled when we had the direction to set aside $140 million. To me, it should be zero. This was a program that was scored out of the new construction category when it was conceived a handful of years ago, and that's where it belongs as far as I'm concerned. So we do delay this. I'm going to want to know why 140, justify 140. I'm hoping it's a f much, much less. And I'm also interested in knowing if a district that has access to other funds to reimburse themselves for the expenditures for these kinds of activities. I think they may exist, and I'd like to know that because, again, it helps me understand that maybe all of this should be moved to new construction because I share your concern, Mr. Chair, that we've got a far higher need in that category than funds available. Um, if I, Mr. Yes, Mr. Duffy, please. The, uh, l let me share my, my opportunity to be perplexed. Um, you had a, a very interesting conversation early on about what the bond sale today really means. And we, we really don't know when real dollars are going to go out to school districts. Uh, we, we asked beginning in, in December for recognizing that this freeze was happening, for the, the, the board and, and your staff to work to do a variety of things, and, and you've done many of them. Unplug the clock. Uh, the, the most recent was the request, although we asked for it long ago, the, the request to do unfunded approvals. 
if, if you are doing unfunded approvals, it means you do not have real funds to actually give to school districts, which is consistent with the discussion that was, was had earlier. So I guess I'm perplexed not knowing what the urgency is if we're really not talking about providing fund releases to districts when we have $1.3 billion worth of, of projects that are actually under contract. So all, all we're asking for is an opportunity to do two things. One is to know what it is that's going to really happen with these dollars. And we're, we're not shy about talking about level three and, and the issue about running out of, of uh, new construction funds. The second is, what does this really mean for districts if they receive any of these dollars and the complications of labor compliance, recognizing that, as we shared with you at the last board meeting, that your budget bill did now cause a transfer of bond dollars to DIR and therefore taking out of the school district's area of responsibility, there's some caveats there, but to take out of their area of responsibility running labor compliance programs. So in short, would there not be a means of taking some portion of those funds and putting them into DIR who will then relieve districts of, of running labor compliance programs. And I don't think we understand all the details of that. We did share it with your staff. We shared it with you at the, at the last board meeting. So asking for your patience just to make sure we understand what it is we do, because I don't think you can retrieve this money if you actually put it into the new construction category with the capital N and the capital C. I don't think that you can just take it back if, if indeed there is some error there. Okay, very good. Uh, thank you, Tom. I really appreciate that input. I do want to assure you that uh, Department of Finance does have uh, DIR funded fully, so that's not a problem. Uh, and we, none of us have a crystal ball. What's the will of the committee? Did you want to put this item over? Yeah, I, would so like I see to head shaking. Yes. Yeah. Did you want to comment on it, Senator? Lee? <clears throat> no, I just think that it just needs more discussion. I would like to put it. Okay. So uh, yes, Mr. Wyland. Well, how how long would we put it over for? Because I, frankly, um, I, I I share your response. I. <laughs> I don't see why we aren't moving the money. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I can't. And I, under I understand the issue, but uh, I'm happy to go with the with the majority of this committee on this issue. I I uh, I think I've made, <coughs> I made you know my point of view is that uh, you know you know I I'm, I continue to be perplexed because since the very moment uh, I assumed this new job, one of the very first things I started getting lobbied on by people sitting in this room was the urgent need to transfer the critically overcrowded school program funds to new construction. We have this great amount of workload that far exceeds what's available. But, you know, if a majority of the members would like to go ahead and, and put this over and wait, I'm fine doing that. I'm just, I'm perplexed. Well, yes, I'm, Dr. Ellerby. I'd like to ask Rob, what are the consequences with us delaying this? We currently have approximately $499 million in bond authority under Proposition 1D left in the new construction account. These funds, up to $840.7 million in critically overcrowded schools, could be transferred over to new construction purposes, um, allowing us to continue to, um, to fund projects for an extended period of time. Now, recognize that currently this is bond authority and it's not real cash. Oh, it's not but at some point when we exhaust our bond authority under Proposition 1D, level three developer fees would theoretically kick in which is an onerous burden upon developers out there in, a, in an environment where the building industry is not only in a recession, they're in a depression. And, and it also stops this board from making either unfunded approvals or regular approvals, assuming that we have, that we have funds. That would, we, would, we would cease at that point. Um, did that help, Dr. Ellerby? Yes, it did. <laughs> uh, I, I, see, uh, I see we have a representative here from the building industry. Uh, Mr. Lyons, would you like to address this point? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Richard Lyon, <clears throat> on behalf of the California Building Industry Association. Uh, we, uh, we, uh, we sympathize with uh, Mr. Duffy, and we too are concerned about uh, uh, school districts being exposed for LCP costs. We think the uh, the appropriate uh, uh, information coming from the Office of Public School Construction out to school districts that there is uh, an obligation to comply with LCP 
should uh, should solve that problem. Um, we we want to go on record and, and need to go on record as saying we believe that the full amount of uh, the uh, COS money from Prop 47 should be shifted over to the new construction program. Uh, we are good neighbors. We understand the concern of some of the urban school districts. Uh, so we would uh, be comfortable uh, um, with the staff recommendation today to move $700 million over today and to keep $140 million uh, in reserve for three months. We think that's the appropriate action to be taken by this committee. We are getting close, uh, members, to, to use a football term, <clears throat> to the red zone, uh, where the unfunded list is uh, larger than the money that's in the new construction account. And when we get to the point where the state allocation board has run out of money for new construction, we are at the point then when 100% of the cost for financing new construction is on the back of new home buyers. And I would, uh, I would uh, say that that's a crisis uh, point. That's the nuclear option for this program. None of us want to get there. Uh, as as uh, Mr. Cook said, uh, this industry, the home building industry, is in a deep, deep trough, and it's going to be some time before we come out. So uh, we would support the recommendation of the staff today, and we would urge you to take that action today. Mr. Uh, Weiland? Yes. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I agree with that assessment, and uh, I would at least, uh, I don't know what the rule is, but I would move that we, that we accept that, and I think it's been outlined very clearly. The, uh, Mr. Need, the, need is, the need is there, and it happens to dovetail with uh, uh, our other critically important problem, which is uh, the, the houses that are, that are being built. Okay, thank you, Mr. Ryland. So you have a motion to uh, approve this item. It's so noted, it's on the floor. Uh, we have had a request by other board members to have some more testimony on this item. I know that Senator Lowenthal has some questions he'd like to ask, and so we'll leave your motion on the floor and Senator Lowenthal. Uh, in listening so far to the discussion, I, uh, I would be fine in voting for it today. I mean, I, I really do think we could need, but I'm listening to the discussion about the need to put it into the Con the new construction. Okay, Senator. Uh, so are there other board members that wanted to comment on this item? I just, uh, I'd like to hear the rest of the testimony. Thank you. Okay. Sure. Um, could you please identify sure. yourself Mr. for the Mr. Chair, record? Member Cesar Diaz on behalf of the State Building and Construction Trades Council. feel the need to come up here and express mm -hmm. our, our uh, concerns with regards to different pots of money and different requirements that are being put on the school districts. We uh, are, are supporters of labor compliance programs. Uh, as you understand, during the uh, budget negotiations, we did negotiate and had actually the formation, creation of a state public works enforcement fund. They actually provide the Department of Industrial Relations with the resources they need to go out and enforce labor compliance that are now being enforced by school district or third party labor compliance programs. The actual regulations are, are yet to be formulated and set, and so they do not go into effect, and so no contract is affected until those regs are in place, which we see probably at the end of the year if we are able to you know, develop the uh, group of stakeholders and then develop the, the guidelines and regulations for that. Um, we do want to express, though, that labor compliance programs are an essential and important piece, especially now when so many contractors are going out and bidding on public works projects because of the dry spell in residential construction, a lot of these contractors have no experience with regards to public works contract law or prevailing wage law. Uh, so the guidance that this board can provide to school districts in terms of which pots of money are, are able to trigger the labor compliance programs is important. Now, we would suggest perhaps that they commingle some of these funds so that there isn't any uh, confusion and that the labor compliance programs are funded and they run simultaneously until the Prop 47 monies run out. Well, I really appreciate that testimony. I think you raised some really good points. I would like to just get a couple more things on the record relative to what you said, sir. I do want to assure you that the uh, 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 personnel and funding requirements for the Department of Industrial Relations um, is being uh, taken care of uh, through the governor's budget. In fact, it was approved uh, in February of this year when the legislature passed the budget early. And 
I know that there is a lot of concern. Uh, I'm not an expert. I'm not an attorney. But I know there's a lot of concern as to whether or not these bond funds could even be available to fund that. But we're using general fund dollars and other special fund dollars to fund the work of the Department of Industrial Relations. So I don't want you to be concerned that any action that we take on these bond funds may somehow put DIR at a disadvantage. That's not the budget plan that was approved by the well, legislature. Sir, I'd like to clarify that. We actually were proponents of XB2. Uh, 2x9, the Padilla bill that created the Public Works Enforcement Fund, and what that actually did was let, allow the Department of Industrial Relations to levy a fee of up to a quarter of 1% out of every state public works contract to actually go to the EIR and select those funds. Excellent. So we're, we're supportive of that as well. Good. But until that, is into it, it, uh, until that goes into effect, our concern is that some of these requirements in terms of 47 and the labor compliance requirement there will go bare or ignored because of the confusion with Prop 1D not carrying a labor compliance program requirement. Okay. Um, do we have, yes, Ms. Brownlee. Well, I just, you know, uh, I think at the last meeting, Ms. Moore had requested staff to develop uh, a process to protect, um, you know, the applicant's order in line on the, in the event of these 1D funds. I, I don't see a recommended process to give us those certainties and uh, I think that we should have that before us, clearly, before we begin to proceed on this. And so m I would propose that we um, delay this decision until we have more information. And actually, I, under I see these letters from um, the, the Building Industry Association and letters from the speaker, of which I have not received. Uh, so I, I, speak I, I haven't received a letter from the speaker either. What does the speaker's letter say? So anyway, I just I would rather have information, uh, mm -hmm. have all of the information in front of me before I proceed with a, a vote, and would prefer to have it delayed. Mm -hmm. Could could we? Uh, I think many of us would be interested in what the speaker has to say, but we haven't seen that. Uh, actually, um, I got these in the hall, and I would be um, happy to share them after I, since no one else has them, after I make sure they're authentic. Because <laughs> you're making me nervous now. <laughs> That's all right. No, I always, I don't mind sharing with you, Julia. I just, uh, I just assumed everybody else got one in the hall. Uh, Go ahead, uh, Mr. Lyons. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I just want to make sure I understand the the concern. Let, let, let. The, Uh, Senator Weiland, do you want to ask your question first, or do you want to have Mr. Lyons provide some more information? I, I, I will follow Richard yeah. 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 Mr. Lyons, could you please? I, I think maybe I can shed some light on the letters, uh, <coughs> members. Uh, uh, I wrote Rick Simpson uh, a week ago uh, asking Rick if, in his opinion, the Prop 47 money, the critically overcrowded school money, uh, is required by law to go back into the new construction account. That was the only issue I asked him. He, he wrote back to me and said, yes, according to law, the Prop 47 COS money is required to go back into the new construction account. That's what, that's what the letter says. It has nothing at all to do with the LCP issue. I would like to just add, add one more thing that I think is important for all the members to consider. Um, and I'm, you know, whatever the will of this committee is, is fine with me, but I'd hate to send the wrong signal uh, to those uh, people out there that are trying to make decisions on what to do with the bond funds. And I think that, you know, we have a lot of workload on the books for new construction, and we don't have enough resources there, authority there right now to fund it. And if this body continues to delay making those resources available, um, it, it might influence some decision makers and say, well, they don't need all that money for schools right now. I mean, I think we need to do everything we can and show all the signals that we can that we're serious about getting the school construction money out the door. And I just worry about the signal that delaying this vote would send. Mr. Harvey. I would like to second Senator Weiland's motion. Um, just to His motion was to accept the transfer of funds. We have some members here that would like to delay it, and we have some members that express their willingness to move forward, and so a should question. we have a vote on this to see where the votes are? Could I, could I just have a question? Yes, Ms. Fuller. I'm trying to follow up on Ms. Brownlee's. Um, initially, we were trying to, I think, I'm trying to see if, if, if by doing this we could fund, if by commingling we could fund 
more school districts projects because of the way the timelines and the stipulations were. Um, that was one of our concerns and I can't, I don't know, and I, I, I agree, I, don't, I can't tell by looking at this if actually by doing that we accomplish that by mm -hmm. being able to, to fund more districts than we would have been able to fund. That's, that's like the first question and then I have another one after that. Okay. Um. Well, I'm not sure the, the question, uh, I'm not sure the, the answer to your question is about commingling. I will tell you that as we were transitioning from Proposition 55 that has a labor compliance program requirement in it to Proposition 1D that does not have this, our staff became very adept at con confirming the presence or lack thereof of a labor compliance program and funding school district projects accordingly. And I believe our record stands for itself in that no one got into trouble regarding labor compliance program in our handling of those of those dollars and those projects. So we we know how to pay attention to it. We know it's a very big deal to the to folks out there. Um, we're uh, we believe that outreach and making sure that folks are aware of the requirements out there is is obviously a big step. But our staff is adept at it at managing that. We, we got very good at it under Prop 55 to 1D. We can manage the same thing in Prop 47 to 1D. Um, Ms. Fuller, did you have a follow-up question? Okay, so if I understand the situation correctly, we thought that if we moved money, uh, if we moved this money, that we would be able to get it out faster even though we don't have the funding now because the approvals would be done and that we would be able to fund a larger uh, amount of schools quicker who need relief. Now we have uh, one group who wants the money now, one group who's not sure if the people will know what to do if they get it because they're not sure what the regulations are, and another group who's pretty sure they don't know what the regulations are. I'm a little confused, so uh, I'm, uh, if anybody can clear that up, then I'll know how to vote because right now I don't. Um. Uh, uh, hold on, I have, uh, Ms. I have Ms. Gerard and then I have Mr. Weiland and I would like to just say for the record, I never thought this was that confusing and I get the sense that there have been some that have tried to make it more confusing. Maybe you can unwind that a little bit for us, Rob. Uh, I have Ms. Gerard and then Mr. Weiland. Actually, I just want to go on the record. Um, labor compliance programs, I'm not for them. I think that they're added costs that we don't need, but under the circumstances we have right now, um, we do need to get the money out there. So for me, I, and I know that staff is very good at keeping control and making sure that they advise the school district so that they, there is no problems with this. We have funds there, we need to move. I'd like to see these projects move forward. Um, we're stuck with this labor compliance um, situation. I think um, for me, uh, I would say, uh, I would ask and go along with you to move this forward. Okay, Senator Weiland. Um, I, I think one of the issues, and, and see if I have this correct, uh, in addition to the transfer of funds, is the uh, labor compliance issue. I agree that that's real. And, uh, and as I understand it uh, from Mr. Diaz, where it's going to be a while before it's all set in place with the DIR. I just, I, I would hate to not to, to hold this up if we have a method which exists now, even though it's going to be supplanted by this new method, that I understand, Rob, is working. Uh, because most, at least in my area, all the schools that are built do have various forms of labor compliance agreements, and they, they seem to follow them. And it just seems to me that you know, we need to start doing this. The other issue with cash is not as clear to me, um, and it just you know, seems to me we ought to move the money and, and, and get going, and we can take care of the labor compliance. However, imperfectly, uh, and, and, and until the DIR uh, regulations begin. It's put over. Uh, thank you. Ms. Hancock. Yeah, thank you, and I appreciate Mr. Weiland's uh, question. 
I, I think I need to ask it again, partially because we're all trying to figure out why what we thought was a non-controversial item is controversial. <laughs> um, and I, I would actually like to ask, uh, it appears to me to be logical and e efficient to move the money out today unless it leaves a big loophole and question mark about whether the uh, project labor agreements, which are now required, I believe, by law, but the regulations are not finished yet, <laughs> that are we creating a loophole in which uh, uh, projects would move forward without labor compliance agreements in place? Um, if I can answer your question, Thanks, um, this would not create a loophole. Uh, Proposition 47 requires, and the funding associated with it requires a labor compliance program. Proposition 1D does not require that. If we move these funds from Proposition, uh, these funds stay within Proposition 47. They are simply transferred to new construction under Proposition 47. They don't move over to 1D. That that is something this board can't can't do. They stay within Proposition 47. They retain all the features of Proposition 47, including the uh, labor compliance program component. So these, these projects are, are all under that umbrella, anything that's funded from this. Uh, as far as the, the broader issue with the, with the, the recent trailer bill, um, we've actually initiated discussions with the Department of Industrial Relations to try to determine whether, as an umbrella, program that that would take care of the labor compliance issues for for school construction projects in general and if not then how we advise school districts but we've already initiated those discussions with the Department of Industrial Relations because this is a this is a very important issue and it's a and it's something that has to be dealt with it it means the difference between access to the funds and not okay so. Rob now I don't understand this because the recent trailer bill mm -hmm. sets out a sort of general requirement for project labor agreements and bond funded construction. Am I mm -hmm. right? No. Uh, I if believe I'm not, I believe, tell you, me. I believe you're correct. I am not familiar with the specifics okay. of the bill. Um, if that's what it does, but if Proposition 47 requires that already, what would, why, I would assume that until any new regulations are developed, whatever the regulations are in Prop 47 would continue. That is correct. Okay. So what's the problem? <laughs> I don't <laughs> see a problem. Okay. Um, Mr. Walrath, are you tag teaming with your colleague, Mr. Duffy, tonight? No, actually, I wasn't intending to come up until the conversation started confusing me as well. <laughs> Dave Walrath representing Small School District Association. <laughs> Senate Bill 9 of Second Extraordinary Session contained a number of provisions. One is the DIR provision on the fee. Uh, the second is, to best my knowledge, it repeals the ability to use third party LCP providers. Henry's nodding his head up and down. Small school districts do not have their own LCPs. They have always used third-party providers. So the issue I bring before you is if this goes forward prior to the DIR regulations being taken care of, then I'm not sure where a small district is that doesn't have their own, who is under 47 required to have one, cannot do a third party, but is going to have to rely upon DIR. I don't know what the timing and sequencing is. So up until some of these other conversations, I too thought this was a fairly straightforward issue. I'm now not so sure. The second piece is we don't even have the money to make the fund releases on $1.2 billion that's sitting there all ready to go under fund release. This is a transfer for future apportionments for which we have no assurance that we have any money right now to make on a fund release. In addition to the 2.4 billion, of which half may be subject to fund release, and another 1.2 coming in on that 2.4. I would request that you delay, not for any other reason than all of a sudden, I'm not sure how a small district who might get an apportionment under this 
might be affected as we go forward. And I thought uh, Ms. Moore's comments on a process would have created a structure that would have protected small districts by the nature of that process. So I'm now confused. Thank you, Mr. Walroth. Rob, is there anything you can uh, say that will address the issue about the small school districts and their using third parties with the Prop 47 funds? All I can say is I, I would defer to, to Caesar's judgment that this bill doesn't become effective until the regulations become effective. So I think, frankly, that uh, Proposition 47 would be governing in this instance, and that would mean that they would have access to third party providers. Also, we've but many. Rob, I'm sorry, I'm going to interrupt you. This would be adding to a pot of $499 million that's already there. If there was a small school district that came forward and it was unclear, there was some ambiguity, you know, the regs hadn't been adopted or whatever, couldn't their request be funded out of uh, this other pot of money and not Prop 47? I mean, that's correct. It could so, well wouldn't be. that address the issue that Mr. Walrath raised? That would. Okay, so. So there may be some uncertainty here over these regs and what would be governing this and that, but what we're really talking about is we've got $800 million in workload on the books right now. We've only got $499 million to fund it. Mm -hmm. We've got, you know, $840 million sitting over in this other pot, and I don't know whether that letter's authentic or not, but we've got somebody that's a lot smarter than I am in the Speaker's office, Rick Simpson, who says the legislation clearly said that this money sh uh, should and would be available to transfer over, mm -hmm. and it just seems to me that that uh, uh, we could do that and uh, increase the size of this pot significantly and send a signal to everybody that we're serious about doing business. Rob, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. No, I think you said it all. Mr. Rard, did you want to add something else? Mm -hmm. Are there any other members want to, uh, we, have a, we do have a motion second on the I'd floor. I'd like to hear from Mr. Duffy. Oh, sure, of course. Mr. Um, Duffy. Mr. Cheehy, and, and again, uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, you, you made a comment a, a few minutes ago that uh, I think is important. You said we don't want to send a message that uh, that we don't need this money. Uh, we're, we're really not talking about actual funds because the actual funds are not available. However, if the 1.3 billion dollars that we know school districts have signed contracts for would be funded quickly because of this action, cash would be willing to support it. The the caveat being that no one gets hurt because of the issues of of the uh, labor compliance and, and DIR. So the, uh, you're, you're, you're smiling, sir. The, no, I, that's, the, that's the, very, that's the, I'm just, I think you're making a very logical request and I'm admiring your skill. Well, the, it, it seems to me that if indeed we are talking about sending a signal, and I realize that uh, you, sir, uh, not only in your role here, but your role with the Department of Finance is significant in, in how that signal is received. Cash would be very much in support of moving this with the caveat that no one gets hurt because of the labor compliance issues, if indeed it means that the $1.3 billion of, of funding could go out and could go out quickly to, to school districts because that, that clearly is a signal on, on the part of, of you as, as a body that you want to fund projects <coughs> that, that really the state is obligated to fund by virtue of statute. We, we have sent a letter to you that you would have received today in response to the communication from the treasurer's office about the, the bridge financing, so we're trying to do everything we can to keep school districts alive with their projects. But if, if you could do that, Mr. Chairman and Board, then uh, we, we would with, withdraw our concern about moving forward with this. Thank you very much. Tom, I admire you very much, and I, I admire, when I, for the those of you that are wondering why I'm smiling, when I was sitting at the Pooled Money Investment Board the other day, Mr. Duffy came to testify, and you did a great job, but he also pivoted on me and started lobbying me on state allocation board issues. And now at the state allocation part, you're pivoting me, you're pivoting and lobbying on others. You're, you're very good, Tom. I, <laughs> I, I admire you very much. Um, I'm willing to go with the, I'm happy to support the majority of this committee. I know there are a couple members who like to put this over. There, we do have a motion, a second. Do we have further questions and discussion on this item? Sir, did you want to address the board? Yes, sir. Please come forward and identify yourself for the record. Mr. Chairman, members of the uh, board, uh, I'm Terry Zinger, president of the uh, Association of Labor Compliance Professionals and also president of Golden State Labor Compliance, one of those third parties that you're, uh, understandably, we have paid specific attention to uh, uh, 9X2, the Senate bill, uh, and we are very, we've been around for as long as there's been widespread labor compliance since 2003. I 
uh, want to say that I believe that the, with all due deference to my friend Tom Duffy and others, uh, I will not speak to any of the other issues, but I think this whole LCP issue is somewhat of a solution in, in search of a problem. Uh, the confusion issue, I think, can be overblown. We've been through it twice. At the initiation, at, right after uh, the uh, labor compliance requirement was passed, uh, 1506 in 2002, there was a bright line in the sand project prior to, <coughs> excuse me, prior to pro, uh, projects after. There was no significant confusion. As Rob has, uh, Mr. Cook has uh, uh, properly noted, we also went through the passage of 1D and the initiation of funding out of 1D. That has not resulted in widespread uh, or general confusion. Uh, the small district issue, it, it has been said that 9X2 uh, prohibits the use of third party uh, labor compliance. That is not true. It creates a financial, it seeks to create a financial disincentive in that uh, certain waivers can be passed or can be granted to districts who want to continue to operate their own approved LCP. But if the district wants to continue to use third party, that quarter of 1% or up to quarter of 1% fee may not be waived. Uh, it is not true that, that they're prohibited. They, they are free to use third parties till the cows come home. And in fact, projects will be funded out in November, December of this year because we truly, and, I, and I've been in close contact with uh, council at DIR, they don't expect uh, the regs to be done until about the first of the year. You could have a two, three year high school project that will continue to have the old rules applied two, three years out. Okay. because it was initiated. So there really isn't a problem here. Uh, we, we would see it because we, kept, we would get that panic call from the district who didn't know they had to and now they have to and back and forth. And we've just not seen that. Occasionally you get the one who's just asleep at the wheel, but by and large districts are not that unaware. We're putting the word out. Uh, OPSC is putting the word out. It's quite clear. And I think it's somewhat of a false issues. Other issues notwithstanding, things about concerns over uh, level threes and stuff, I certainly defer to, but. Uh. Okay, we've had quite a bit of testimony. I know that there, there, you know, there's mixed feelings on this board. I know that also Senator Tordickson, who's not, Assembly Member Tordickson, who's not here at the moment, will be arriving later, and he may want to weigh in on this. So if it's okay with the board members, we could take a vote, we could place this measure on call. I don't know how Assemblyman Tordickson might want to vote. If we don't have enough, uh, if it doesn't look like there's enough support for this, then we'll just simply have it put over because there's not enough support. But if there is, then we can move on. Is that? Okay, so we have a motion by Senator Weiland to approve the staff recommendation, which is to transfer $700 million and reserve $140 million for three months until the June meeting. And we have a second by Mr. Harvey. Ms. Jones, could you please call the roll? And I'm going to just say ahead of time, we're going to move a call on this issue and leave it open. Uh, so that the members that aren't here can weigh in. Okay. Mr. Chair, one footnote, since um, a f one of the speakers noted about my nodding of the head, um, I did not, I agreed with the first part of that speaker, but uh, my conversation with DIR is consistent with the last speaker. That is, LCP programs and third-party LCPs are not um, repealed. There is a financial disincentive. And based on my communications with uh, DIR, it's all, I also got the same information that the regulations at the earliest case scenario, um, they're looking at January of 2010. Okay, Henry. Well, you know, hopefully we're going to have all this money out the door by then. So we have a motion and a second. Ms. Jones, could you please call the roll? Yes. Senator Lowenthal. Aye. Senator Hancock. Aye. Senator Weiland. Aye. Assemblymember Fuller. Assemblymember Brownlee. Assembly member, uh, I'm sorry, Scott Harvey? Aye. Dr. William Ellerby? No. Rosario Gerard? Aye. Tom Sheehy? Aye. Okay, we have six ayes, one abstention, and one no. We're going to leave this measure on call because uh, we have a couple of members that would still like to weigh in. And we'll come back to this when uh, Assemblyman Torlickson's here, okay? Let's now. So we, we have item number eight on call. Item number six was non-controversial. Can we have a motion and a second to approve item number six? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve tab number six. Um, is there any objection to a unanimous roll call here? Okay, so item number six is approved. Um, I had requested a roll call vote on <laughs> item number seven, uh, which is the Lammersville Elementary Funding, uh, Ms. Uh, do we have a motion uh, to approve item number seven? So moved. 
We have a motion and a second. Ms. Jones, could you please call the roll on, on, on item number seven, Lammersville? Yes. Senator Lowenthal? Aye. Senator Hancock? Aye. Senator Wyland? Aye. Assemblymember Fuller? Aye. Assemblymember Brownlee? Aye. Scott Harvey? Dr. Ellerby? Aye. Rosario Gerard? Aye. Tom Sheehy? I'm an abstain. Okay, so that motion has seven votes. It's approved. So we've taken care of the consent special items. We have one item on call we'll come back to. Uh, Rob, can you uh, uh, help move us forward now on the special appeals? Certainly, at, uh, at the blinding pace we're moving here. Um, I think I'd turn your attention towards uh, tab nine and, uh, and I'll let Lori uh, Actually, uh, wait a second, Barbara here? Barbara. Yeah, Barbara. Barbara Camp Minert, uh, who is a, does a stellar job with, with the charter schools and charter school community, uh, will address this item. Good afternoon. <coughs> On February 23rd, 2005, the board approved 28 preliminary approvals. Sorry, miss, could you just move that microphone? Could you try to scoot a little bit closer? I'd sure. I think they might help. <coughs> Thank you. Um, the board approved 28 preliminary apportionments to charter schools out of the funding made available through Proposition 55. To date, seven have converted to a final apportionment and eight have been rescinded. The remaining 13 applicants have requested that the board grant them a one-year extension. The board has the authority under the Education Code and in regulation to grant a single one-year extension to those applicants who have made progress towards filing an, towards filing an application for final apportionment. Staff has reviewed the extension request from the 13 applicants and believes that a one-year extension is warranted for all of the projects. The recipients of these funds have faced several challenges in converting their apportionments. In the interest of maximizing the number of apportionments made, SB 15 made changes to the charter school facility program, which strictly capped the preliminary apportionment amounts. A while back, the board acknowledged the difficulty of converting to a final apportionment and constructing the project within the original preliminary apportionment allowances and provided regulatory relief at the April 2007 meeting. Since that point, which was about two years into the four-year time frame, the applicants have been working dil diligently to move forward. Recently, the state's inability to release funds has also hindered some of these projects from finalizing site purchases. Given the circumstances these applicants have faced, staff believes that all have been working in good faith towards conversion and recommends that the board grant the one-year extension for the 13 applicants listed on the attachment. Okay, so staff's recommending approval of the uh, appeal request. Is there a question or comments by board members? Mr. Harvey. I just have a point of clarification. I have no issue, I'm sure, with the San Francisco application. But in four categories, nothing has been X'd. And you talked in terms of progress during the last four years. We're giving them a year extension. What certainty do we have that uh, this charter can move forward in that time frame since they haven't even had a CDE progress? I'm just wanting to make sure we're not building false expectations, not doing something imprudent because uh, they may have issues, and we should recognize those if, if, if there are, because there's 14 million sitting there, and if this is not going to happen, that could be put back into the pot, and others could qualify for and use those dollars. So give me a, a little better sense of your finding that they made progress when nothing has been checked. Well, for, for that project, we actually met with them just this week to check in. They... Um, they were the last project in line when Prop 55 was funded, so they had the option to either not receive any funding at all or to, um, to limit the apportionment amount. And what they did is they cut out the majority of their site acquisition budget. Um, at the time, the program was capped so that you could not transfer money from your construction categories to your site categories, and they felt that they would have more flexibility in finding a site for the lesser dollars than in finding a contractor that would build a school for lesser amounts. So initially they had hurdles in finding a site within San Francisco Unified School District. Um, the area is very developed, uh, land is very expensive. Recently they have um, experienced some positive interactions with the district and they've informed us that they've 
have several options. Um, as, as we noted on the attachment, they are pursuing some legislative changes to try to help this project go forward, but they have also assured us that they have um, every intention to actively pursue a plan B in case that legislation is not passed. So they are, they are looking for project sites that may be viable in the event that the legislative changes that they're seeking um, do not um, go forward. So. Additional question or comments from the board? Just a quick yes. follow-up. Do, do we monitor throughout the year their progress or lack thereof? So if they really aren't as optimistically able to do what they want to do as they hope to, we could revisit this $14 million because I'm sure there are others standing in line that would love to access it. We do check in with all of the applicants on a fairly regular basis. Um, and we have had applicants that have approached us prior to the deadline to rescind the projects. However, I think the second answer to that question is that the money for the Prop 55 projects is reserved through regulations until all of the Prop 55 projects either convert or rescind. So even if we were to rescind this project today, the money would not be available until all of the Prop 55 projects had either converted or rescinded. So we're looking at if any of them are granted a one-year extension, there's the one-year extension and then the time period where the apportionments become inactive is also added on there. So we're, we're a ways away from actually being able to reapportion those funds. Well, thank you for clarifying. I appreciate it. We have a motion by Senator Hancock to approve uh, item number nine. Is there, we have a second by Ms. Brownlee. Uh, is there um, any request for roll call vote here? If not, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, this item's approved. Uh, Mr. Cook, could you please uh, set up uh, item number 10? Um, yes. <clears throat> item number 10 deals with um, career technical education facilities. Uh, you, as you may know, this board funded the first round of career technical education facility, uh, facilities at our March meeting a year ago. Um, and within our regulations, it, uh, districts are required to bring in uh, DSA-approved plans uh, within one year of the apportionment. That date is tomorrow um, for those projects. At our February meeting, this board adopted emergency regulations to provide up to a 12-month extension to those projects due to the issues we have with the funding freeze. Those regulations are not yet in effect, um, but what this item that it has before you uh, seeks to do is to uh, for the board to declare that a fiscal, fiscal emergency does exist and, and declare the intent of this board to provide an extension to these districts or pardon me, to these projects when those regulations become effective. Um, and with that. Uh, okay, good. Senator Weiland's still here because I know this is an important issue with him. Uh, are there other questions or comments from board members here on uh, item number 10, which deals with uh, the career technical education facilities? Um, Mr. Sheehy, I, I would move the it's item. Second. I don't think it's controversial. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Motion by Senator Hancock, a second by Assemblymember Brownlee. All in favor? Aye. 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 Item number 10 is approved. Item number 11. Um, yes, I would like to introduce. Uh, Ms. Masha Lutzik, uh, to discuss... Uh, Sorry, Rob, could you read her name in the record again? I didn't catch that. Masha Lutzik. And, uh, it's a challenge to pronounce, I know. I apologize. Um, is that an official request? Okay, well, we're making progress, so why don't we move on? Okay, uh, uh, Ms. Lutzik, could you Thank please... You. Uh, address item number 11 for us on the fund releases for apportion projects. Thank you. Um, this item in front of you is really a continuation of earlier discussions uh, both here at the uh, board and also at the implementation committee regarding um, potential fund release uh, priorities in um, uh, upon future availability of state bond funds. And the um, universe of projects that we're talking about at this moment is also um, listed on the attachment, and those are the projects that have been apportioned by the State Allocation Board but are subject to the uh, fund release freeze um, by the PMIB. Um, the um, um, 
at the last, uh, at the February meeting, uh, the board requested uh, staff to bring the item back to the implementation committee for discussion, which we did. And the first part of this discussion item on stamped page 76 under staff comments is intended to provide you a quick synopsis of the discussions at the committee. And those discussions were very fruitful. Um, they were um, very um, in depth and we um, highlight some of the concerns that were elevated at those meetings. Um, they're in the bullet list at the bottom of the page. Um, the committee and audience um, wanted to um, explore the potential use of um, general obligation bond funds to cover um, unanticipated borrowing costs that districts had to incur. This would include loan origination fees and um, interest costs um, that they've had to incur in absence of state funds. There was also a lot of discussion regarding potential appeals to the priority funding order to be established by the board. And as we felt in the, uh, the majority of the uh, discussion uh, resolved in the um, agreement that appeals at this moment would be very impractical because there would be a multitude of uh, appeals with multitude of different circumstances expressed by school districts. Um, there was also discussion regarding prioritization based on notice to proceed, which we cover in one, some of our options later on in the item, as well as discussion about a potential option of reserving a um, certain amount of funds to cover projects in what was described as worst of the worst circumstances. So if you follow with me and turn to page 77 under the discussion section of this item, based on the discussions at the implementation committee, we um, outlined some options. And I will quickly cover these options for you. We try to uh, briefly um, summarize some of the pros and cons for these um, different options as well as actions required. Under option A simply uh, would represent a status quo and that's again. Tell me where you are. Stamp page 77. Okay. Oh, tab we're now 11. Gotcha. Right. Thank tab you. 11, uh, stamp page 77. And I'm just on top of that page under option A. So this would simply represent a status quo. Um, if we had the normal circumstances um, surrounding this issue and um, funding would be provided or fund release requests would be processed by the um, Office of Public State um, School Construction in the order of date received. And that is also um, on the attachment we list the projects in the order of um, date received of the Form 5005 just for your information so you can see the uh, universe of projects and the um, order that they would fall in under this option. This uh, is what we refer to as FIFO first in, first out, and there's really no um, additional action required by the board. Um, this approach, although is convenient and it is a status quo and districts know what to expect um, under normal circumstances, does not have a uh, means to address districts in the worst of the worst circumstances. So that's when we move on to option B, which would be uh, first in, first out, um, process for providing funds when funds become available with the exception of uh, granting exemptions to school districts deemed to be in the worst of the worst circumstances. And since, as I already mentioned, appeals wouldn't be a practical option, this option would require further discussions at the implementation committee to develop these criteria for determining which districts may be granted an exemption. Uh, to the uh, first in, first out or, um, funding order. Option C is also as continuing kind of logical variation on this option. And under option C, um, this reflects the discussion at the implementation committee where some um, members expressed interest in prioritizing fund releases based on notice to proceed. So this would give preference to more mature projects over projects that are, um, have been entered into contract and started construction later. Um, this option can um, also be further modified to include um, certain <coughs> projects for exemption requests, but again, we um, would also then uh, need to establish some criteria for which projects qualify for exemption. Um, the challenge for us under this option would be Without a submitted form 5005, which is what Russia, we refer to. I'm sorry. Be sir, before we go into the challenge on that option, since we don't know whether there's any interest in that option yet, why don't we go on to what option D is and go to your recommendation. Okay. Uh, this was another um, option presented by the stakeholders, which would be um, upon availability of funds, provide funding uh, based on the um, first in, first out order 
and reserve from each available amount of funds a small portion to fund projects in the worst of and worst circumstances. So um, this would be, you know, could be uh, as set up as a percentage. Say 10% of each, all available funds could be available for to fund um, okay, so projects Masha, with extenuating circumstances. I want to ask a question. So, so we were unable to get a clear recommendation out of, or, 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 or a, we were unable to get a, a firm recommendation out of the implementation committee on anything other than first in, first out. Is that an accurate assessment? Yes, but I believe that we've made progress. Okay, all right. So, so our policy has been up to this point for, for the State Allocation Board and OPSC to fund projects on a first in, first out basis. Uh, we had asked uh, to see if we wanted to adopt a policy that could modify that for extreme hardships. They've been working on it. Um, I'm, we can engage in that. Uh, we can engage in that policy discussion now if the members would like. Um, what I think the, uh, uh, I guess the staff recommendation here is essentially to continue FIFO and to continue working in the implementation committee Correct. to come up with a process for dealing with extreme hardships. Um, you know, we, we could try to have that discussion now or we could just continue with the first in, first out and, and bring this, recalendar this item for our next meeting to see if we have a recommendation on the implementation committee. What would the members like to do on this item? Okay, so we have, a, we have a motion and two seconds to approve the staff recommendation. Let me see if I got this right because I didn't to approve my recommendation. The chair's, the chair's recommendation, which would be to continue our current policy, which is FIFO, to continue to have the implementation committee, to have an implementation committee meeting scheduled between now and our next meeting, and, and ask them to continue to work on a firm recommendation on how to deal with extreme hardships and to calendar this same item for our next meeting. So that is the motion. We have a second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. That item is approved. Okay, item number 12 uh, is a uncontroversial, uncomplicated issue. It's a deferred maintenance. There we go. That's all we deal in. Okay. Um, as you will recall at our, at our last meeting, uh, we spent some time discussing uh, Deferred Maintenance, which is a general funded program, um, and what had recently occurred under the uh, under, uh, budget, <coughs> budget action uh, taken up in February. Um, as you may know, <coughs> these funds uh, are part of the categorical relief effort that was put into that budget. And so these funds, while this board allocates those funds, they are now available, once they're allocated, they are, uh, the amounts that this board sets set a baseline for the next five years, and these funds are available for any educational purpose. So they no longer retain the normal restrictions that would be on deferred maintenance and the health and safety portion of these funds, extreme hardship. Under, under statute, this body has the authority or has the flexibility to dedicate up to 10% of these funds for extreme hardship, or that's the category, but those are health and safety projects. Um, and as we, uh, as we discussed at our last meeting, we came up with a number of options that would accommodate, or at least as best we can, accommodate the new reality under, under statute. Um, and if I can go over those briefly with you, uh, option one would be to simply, Bob, yeah. Okay, uh, I'm going to, since you're just starting on what our options are, I'm going to ask your uh, permission to pause for a moment uh, and switch gears. Uh, we have at least one member, maybe two, that may have to leave the meeting, and they've expressed a desire for us to be able to add on to the item that we have on call. So before we get into the options on the deferred maintenance, I'm going to ask Ms. Jones uh, to uh, open the roll. We have... Uh, uh, three members here, I believe the three assembly members who haven't had a chance yet to vote on this item. Could you please call the roll for those members, Ms. Jones? And if there's any other members that want to change a vote, we can do that too. Okay. Assembly member Fuller? Aye. Assembly member Brownlee? Aye. Motion when assembly member Torlickson is not here. Okay. Uh, we're going to leave this uh, item on call because assembly member Torlickson is going to be here uh, soon. And uh, so uh, 
Uh, are the other members okay? Very good. All right, Rob, do you want to take us back to the deferred maintenance item? Thank you. You're welcome. Certainly. <coughs> um, option one that uh, Option one that we've developed is simply a um, is a distribution is, would um, simply take all the funds that were available under this and distribute it proportionately to all the participants in the deferred maintenance program, which is nearly all school districts in the state of California. Um, that particular option does not provide any set aside for any of the uh, extreme hardship health and safety projects that we currently have on our workload. Option two would be to set aside 10 percent of those funds and distribute th those funds to sc school districts with extreme hardship and distribute proportionally the rest of the funds to all other participants in, in the program. Um, one of the issues with that particular um, option is that it sets a baseline that would ultimately fund the extreme hardship projects at about 160 percent over five years. Um, option 2A uh, tries to accommodate, accommodate that issue by distributing 93% uh, of the funds, of the deferred maintenance funds proportionally among school districts, reserving 7% to distri distribute proportionally to the, <coughs> to the extreme hardship projects, providing 20% funding uh, each year over the next five years, eventually two making those projects whole. 2A, then. Is that, that's correct, 2A. Um, option 2B is a very minor variation on that, which increases the allocation per year to 21 percent over 20 uh, to accommodate potential interest costs for if someone were to pursue, <coughs> if someone were to pursue uh, financing to uh, complete those projects. <coughs> Option three would distribute um, the bulk of the 90 percent of these funds to deferred maintenance projects, uh, deferred maintenance participants proportionally, and then take the 10 percent set aside and fund approximately 40 projects at 100 percent um, this year. The uh, one of the issues with that particular option is that it would reset the baseline for pro, uh, for districts, and could would fund those project those extreme hardship projects at approximately 500 percent over the five year period. Option, <coughs> pardon me. Option four would distribute those funds. Um, oh, option four was developed as a result of our discussion at our last board. To, to consider whether these funds could be transferred to an alternative account and then retain the feature of extreme hardship. Um, after examining that issue, um, we came to the conclusion that that would be affected as, a, as an appropriation, either through an individual bill or through the Budget Act, uh, but not, uh, not necessarily something that this board could affect itself. So, Rob, we could do option four, right? But in That's doing right. option four, it would require uh, a, a, it would require legislation either through the Budget Act or through uh, through separate legislation. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, so that does remain an option. Absolutely. Okay, please continue. That's correct. Uh, and then option five was uh, is an option that would provide conditional funding of these projects meaning that the State Allocation Board would put conditions on the funding to deliver to those districts, would distribute 90 percent of the funds to all deferred maintenance participants proportionately, and then uh, provide 100 percent funding to approximately 40 extreme hardship projects um, with conditions that the uh, district complete the project, that they do not add it to their baseline, um, uh, in the course of this. In examining this, this particular option, the board has every authority to put conditions on the funds. Um, as we are looking at it, though, it would not necessarily mean that the, stat the statute would prevail over, over the board's conditions, and there would be no obligation for the district to actually execute the projects, and these, this would add to the baseline um, for a district providing 500 percent of the funding over a five-year period. 
And with that, that's, that's the extent of the options that we've developed. Uh, do, did you, did the staff have a recommendation? I know you have these options. Did you have a recommendation? <laughs> there we uh, go. Uh, staff would recommend option 2A as you wanna, a. You want to just explain one more time succinctly simply. what the recommendation is under 2A and then let's see how the board members feel. That's correct. Uh, option 2A uh, would provide 20% of a project's funding for the extreme hardship projects in any one year, fully funding those projects over a five year period. That's in essence what that. And it would also declare that those projects are funded and not eligible for funding under um, any other program. Okay, so I know we have some public comment on this. Are there any questions right now of the board members or do we want to add any more options to the table to consider? Okay, uh, sir, did you want to come forward and identify yourself for the record? Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Uh, I really am authentic. I am a, a school superintendent. And um, my name is Les Crawford. I'm superintendent of Twin Hills School District in Sebastopol, California. And the school in, uh, that I'd like to speak to you about is called Apple Blossom. It's an elementary school. And my grandson happens to go to school there, and that's where my office is located. So every day I have the opportunity to see not only my grandson, but also 346 other children. And what I would ask you to consider is that we have been in the queue now for almost two years that we were funded, we were approved for funding in October of uh, 2007. And our project is valued at approximately the cost of about $1.2 million. And we expected, we're extreme hardship because of a safety issue around mold and leaky roofs. Now we haven't had a lot of rain in Sebastopol the last couple of years, so that's helped us out. But we could get next year, we could get more torrential rains, we could get up to 50, 60 inches of rain, and we have a serious problem again, the health and safety of the kids. And we cannot afford to do this project on our own. If we only got 20% of the project, we don't have any way to finance the other 80%. We were cut this year, we have a $3.2 million budget, we were cut this year in funding $500,000. That was money that we anticipated getting from the state. So there, and we had to lay off four teaching positions this year for next year. And so we've had to make serious cuts in our budget. So we just don't have any way to borrow that kind of money to do this project. We need it to be fully funded by the state. So I urge you, please, you know, for those school districts that are in extreme hardship for health and safety reasons, please fully fund those projects. Perhaps there might be some who could afford to finance it. We are not in a position to be able to finance it. And it's my duty and responsibility to try to keep those kids as safe and healthy as possible. And so I'm here today to ask you to please, if all possible, fund those extreme hardship projects at 100% in the order in which they were approved. That's what the process has been. That's been the rules of the game. And I urge you to continue to follow the rules that we all started this game under. So Thank Mr. You. Crawford, you're, you're supporting option number one. I'm not sure about the options. I heard several of them, but I want to have, okay. I need, we need 100% funding for our project. No, number no five. you're supporting, oh, supporting option number, number five? five, I think. I apologize. No hardship. I apologize, Mr. Crawford, you're supporting option number five. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, Mr. Walrath. To be clear, I don't think Superintendent uh, Crawford is suggesting that it go into his baseline. <laughs> no. Dave Walrath, representing Small School Districts Association. Before touching on extreme hardship, there are still 850 districts who are not part of extreme hardship. And it's my understanding that they will be receiving their apportionments under the regular deferred maintenance program and that this item is not interfering with that. And I just want to confirm that those funds will be flowing out to the other 850. Is that right, Mr. Cook? Um, we will, depending on the option chosen by this board, we will bring an item back at our next regularly scheduled board, and we may have to shuffle. And we may, there may be some adjustments to those funds, but uh, but it all depends on the options that are chosen by the by well, the board. I I think in part what Mr. Walt, and I stay, please excuse me if I'm wrong, and clarify the record. I think in part what he's asking is he wants to make sure that we don't do something, we don't take an action tonight or lack of action tonight that's going to further delay for everybody else them getting their funds is that right correct what I would suggest is no matter you know we have our proposal a small school district association uh, the request is that if 
uh, you do not make a decision tonight because of the various options, that at least 90% the baseline money go out to districts now if you defer this till April. Uh, no matter what you do, try to get out the money to the other 850 <coughs> immediately because there's no real reason to defer their money. You can always do a supplemental if you go from 90 to 92 or 90 to 93.2 or 90 to some other number at least use the 90% number so they'll have it there. This is stimulus. This gets people to work, trying to get it out as fast as possible rather than delaying till April. Having said that, uh, I've talked to all of you individually or through your staff on our proposal. And that is, in essence, that districts so certify. Uh, I realize that there is a disagreement as to what the legal provisions are. Uh, we believe a district that says that they want it out of their baseline that then comes in and litigates would be in a tremendously awkward litigation position, having certified they don't want it in their baseline and then come forward and say, oops, thank you for the money. We now want to basically undo our certification. We believe that there would be a tremendously difficult legal position. Can I guarantee that no district would ever do that? I suspect no district would ever do that, but I cannot give you the guarantee. You heard the superintendent Crawford's comments. Many, many other small districts are in that situation. Small budgets, they cannot borrow money because to the extent that they do, that's a debt. And if you have a $3 million budget and a million dollar debt, the state has no assurance it can repay. Because this 20% is not guaranteed for the next five years. It's contingent upon state appropriations. So the districts are at significant risk. They now have a large debt, and their county office will start looking at how are you going to repay that debt under AB 1200 conditional, qualified conditional, or negative certifications. These are the problems we all face. We urge you to take the risk of potential litigation, do the proposal, which is to fully fund the projects, on the condition that the district commits that they will not include it in their baseline, on the condition that the district will make its match, on the condition that the district will use the money to fund the project for which they're apportioned. And then let the courts do what the courts do. And if the courts take an action, then there's always statutory relief that can be acquired to prohibit them coming back on in. We request that in order to protect the very, very small districts on their health and safety projects along the way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Walrath. Mr. Is uh, Mr. Patton here? I have a note that uh, Mr. Jim Patton wanted to address the, uh, I'm sorry, Senator Hancock? No, I just have a question, and maybe sure. you could answer it or Rob could answer it. Okay, Senator Hancock. Uh, before we go on with this, um, could you explain the baseline? The baseline, what does that mean? In the baseline or um, out of the baseline? Um, I th right. The, uh, the trailer bill that, uh, that provided the categorical relief uh, in state budget set the, the dollar, well, it, it establishes this year, I believe this year, as a baseline, meaning that this would be whatever funding a district receives in this year would affect the amount that it gets next year in a proportional basis. For example, if it got a okay. simple example, $100 this year under these fundings, okay and the budget goes up by 5%, next year they would see $105. If it went down by 5%, they'd okay. see $95. But it sets the amount that they would get from Thank this point Thank you. Forward. I understand that. So if we gave somebody 100% of the project and it in, was included in their baseline, they would get a lot more money over time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And so the, the issue here is how we clarify in whatever regulations we adopt that that will should we advance the entire amount of money, it would not come out of the baseline, number one. And number two, even though it's included in flexibility, um, if should the district decide not to finish the project, they would not be able to come back for more money later. Correct. The district would certify that they reject having this money put into their baseline, so it would be excluded from the baseline calculation. Oh, thank you, Mr. Walrath. Uh, I believe Mr. Patton wanted to uh, address the uh, the board. Now I get it. Oh, 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman and board members. I just wanted to, I talked about our project last time. I'm Jim Patton representing Alexander, Anderson Valley School District in Mendocino County. And so I've been following what's been happening at the implementation committee. We've been looking very carefully at the options that have been presented at the implementation committee. And I just want to tell you that we have been looking at this at the district level and we simply cannot borrow the money. And so we're faced with having to close down a facility that is a focal point of the entire community. Thanks. I'm, so, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Patton, did you have a recommendation for the board though? Did you, was there an option you were supporting? Yeah, the, the way that, and I've been working with Office of Public School Construction for many years, and the way we have done projects over time is date order received. I, I recognize that these are perilous times, but to kind of shift gears in the middle here uh, is, is uh, in my view, counterproductive. So, uh, yeah, the date order received. And I think a set aside, I know that there are those districts out there that proceeded in good faith with projects and, and, and uh, are unable to complete them, even with the extreme hardship. Okay, and, and you, are, you are giving us your views on the deferred maintenance item, Mr. The Patton? extreme hardship. I'm talking about. Okay. We have an, just as, as Superintendent Crawford, okay. we have an extreme hardship. Yes, Senator Lowenthal. Yeah. I need a, a question. A first, just to understand, if, if we chose option number five, would that need legislation? O option number five assumes that the, can basically, if I could, that the program really didn't undergo a statutory change for the most part. And so I do believe that that would, in really, to, in order to be effective, I do believe that it would require legislation. Uh, I, I just think it's, you know, I, I know we're, it's, this is a difficult call for us all to make, but I think it's important to point out that uh, there was um, a bipartisan budget deal uh, uh, in February that, um, uh, you know, broke down the wall, so to speak, uh, on these categoricals. And I, I, I don't think there's going to be bipartisan support to put those walls back up. So we sort of are where we are. I don't think we're going to unring that bell. We had to give the districts flexibility in order to live at the lower level of revenue limits we were actually giving them. So um, as, as much as I'm, I'm sure there's some people in this room uh, that, you know, myself included, if it was an option to solve this, would like to be able to do it that way. I just don't think we're going to be able to re-erect those walls. And, uh, and if you're right, Rob, that it would require legislation to do this, I'm, we could certainly make that recommendation and try to do it. But I'm concerned that uh, it might not pass and then we're just holding up dollars that otherwise would go out to schools. Uh, so, um, uh, Mr. Chairperson, I, I, I understand that. I, it's just that it's really hard to accept this when both of the districts I'm working with were in the queue since 2007. I understand. And I'm, I understand the And I'm, I'm very, uh, I'm very, uh, um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry that your district is in this situation, Mr. Patton, and I, I, I wish we, there's an action we could take tonight that could address that. Mr. Harvey. It would be nice if we could abide by the rules that we all thought we had. But when the legislature did shake up this arena, as our chair has alluded to, the language was these categoricals got folded into one pot of money, including this program, and they can be used for any educational purpose. And I, I, I so for me to do it on a conditional basis, I'm not sure that's an option because the statute preempts that. Yeah, and it's unfortunate for the board, too. I know that, you, uh, and I've listened to you, and I know your major concern is to get jobs out on the street. My issue is, is if you fund all the projects at 20 percent, how many jobs are going to be on the street? Well, my only, my only comeback, and I know we've cut your dollars extensively, but one of the freedoms in folding the categoricals all together is you get to make your choices on how those dollars can be spent in each and every school district. And if this capital facility project is that important, you might be able to fund it out of 
some of those dollars that can now go to any educational purpose. As a result, I am going to, for the purposes of discussion, to see if we can have action, move staff recommendation on option 2A. So could you please describe your understanding of option 2A again for the record, Mr. Harvey, now that you've made a motion? What it does, it distributes 93% of this category of money proportionally to all participating school districts and provides 7%, in other words, the difference between 193, for hardship, extreme hardship projects. And you distribute that 20% across the board, so every project in extreme hardship, all 126, get some money. Not 40, not 10, but everybody. And when you fund that over five years, 100% of the project costs are paid for. Okay, thank you, Mr. Harvey. We have a could motion. I have a on chance, the could I have a chance to, to address this yes. under the categorical programs? The categorical. Yes, sir, sir. Yes, you may. You absolutely may. But let us do our business first. We're not going to vote on it yet. We have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Okay, we have a motion by Mr. Harvey and a second by Ms. Fuller. And please identify yourself for the record. Uh, Les Crawford, Superintendent, Twin Hill School District. Yes, Mr. Uh, the categorical funding flexibility is a really good thing. Um, we get about $120,000 a year. The bulk of that is going to pay staff to teach uh, Title I reading, providing uh, tutorial support for students. That, that, that we do not have the flexibility there. I guess we do have the flexibility. We could choose not to educate the kids and we could put it in the facilities. I would ask you this. If it appears that the only way that you can resolve this is to spread this money out over a period of five years, it would be possible, I think, to be able to convince a local school board who has fiduciary responsibility and who we have to have approved budget by the county, that if we could be assured that the financing costs over that five-year period of time was going to be part of what was going to be covered by the state, then we could probably then take that risk to go ahead, move forward with the project if we knew for certain that the, the entire project was going to be funded, including the financing over a five-year period of time. That might make us whole and allow us to move forward. Thank you, Mr. Crawford. I appreciate that, uh, that testimony. Okay, we do have a motion on the floor in a second. Ms. Hancock. Um, yeah, I think maybe we should say that nobody really knows anything about what's going to happen in five years because we never thought we'd be taking some of the votes we took on the budget. But I am concerned by about hearing that if the costs are spread over five years, there are some districts that won't be able to, to do them for five years because my understanding is we're talking about some things like septic tanks. I mean, extreme hardship is heavy duty health and safety kinds of issues. And I'm wondering why we couldn't, um, in our own regulations, forget the trailer bill language and the baseline simply indicate that if we did hold this money out and gave them to schools, they would sign a waiver saying that they would not come back for any more money for this project. So if you don't, if you decide to hire another reading teacher and not replace your septic tank, how you replace your septic tank is up to you. Okay, Ms. Hancock. Um, I mean, and I just, cook? are you making, I mean, uh, could we do that? Could we do that? I mean, I just, um, because it would seem to me then we wouldn't have to, deal with legislation Rob, and the I'm intent sorry. of the law, we'd be dealing with our own regulations. Rob, before you answer that, can finance uh, offshed any light on that from the standpoint of how we do the budget? I know you don't really want to jump into this, Jeannie, but I think uh, uh, Senator Hancock has asked a good question, and, uh, and I think we need, need to understand how the budget's going to be built next year. Uh, and then you may want to make a substitute motion, if it, depending on what Ms. Orpeza says. So I, so I think there's maybe two different issues as to whether or not districts can come back either after the five-year period to get funding for these same projects. So I'm not sure if that's where, where your question is going because theoretically the way that budget language is written, we could give all these districts the full amount over five years and they technically could come back in after those five years and submit the same project for funding. And I'm not sure if that's what you're trying to oh, address. No, no. See, what I was asking, um, Ms. Arapesa, was dealing with extreme hardship only. I mean, right now, the 90% of the funds that we give out for deferred maintenance 
may in fact go to hire another reading teacher or some other worthy purpose under the flexibility uh, decision. But that's the regular deferred maintenance, which almost every school building we have that hasn't had modernization money recently has a problem with. Extreme hardship is health and safety stuff. Um, we've heard that some smaller districts, unless they get the lump sum of money, really don't have the capacity to borrow enough money to do something like, say, replace a septic tank. So um, in, if we give them an extreme hardship grant, this board, and they accept it, but they signed a waiver at the request of this board uh, saying that they uh, would execute the project and they would not come back ever for money for, this, for that septic tank, uh, that we would go ahead and advance them 100% of the money and we would, ha we would be covered so that they wouldn't, in fact, take the money and run, so to speak, and come back in five years for the same right. project. I think the way the, the law is currently written, you could not do that because if you gave them the money, it would be built into their base. And so you would need a statutory change to say that that would not happen. And as uh, Mr. Sheehy said, at this point, the administration is going to stick to the agreement that was reached as part of the overall budget and we wouldn't necessarily support those types of changes. Once you take one program out or make other changes, then everything else, you know, starts to come out. And it was a difficult enough um, agreement to make to begin with, so. Senator Weiland. Um, <clears throat> I wish we could do what uh, Senator Hancock suggested, and I, I'm trying to let me just go back to make sure I understand. That's the same thing that would apply to option five. As you understand it, it would, it would require statutory change. Um, well, I, I, I feel the plight of these districts, and I think it's m much more difficult in a really small district there's just harder, it's harder because there's just not much there in a larger district, any larger entity, there are more moving parts and I think it's easier to do that. Um, was this contemplated? Maybe, and you don't have to answer this. I, I, I think my impression is that when a lot of budget deals are done, you can't contemplate every single thing that might occur. And so I, I just, and you may not even have the answer to this, but I, I wonder, I mean, is your sense is that, that e even in a special case like this that was not contemplated, that the administration would be reluctant to support it because of the fear of everything then unraveling? Well, and I can tell you for a fact that we did have a discussion on, on extreme hardship okay. when, we, when we made the decision to include it. Okay. Um, I, th I personally think there's more flexibility, you know, and obviously we want to try and work with the district to see what flexibility there was, but there's several categoricals that I know go to every single district, and while it may not be optimal to have to use it for that purpose, it may give them enough um, um, flexibility to, to maybe work something out. Senator Lowenthal. I believe, was it Mr. Carpenter from the small school district? I wanted to ask if I, huh? Crawford, Crawford Mr. Crawford. If, if 2A, I'm just wondering the impact, because what you're saying is if we did 2A, Mr. Crawford, you could live with that over five years if the financing costs were also included within that. Is that not so? I believe that would be workable because what I would, what I would need in order to get the votes of my school board is to be able to assure them that we were going to be able to afford this two years, three years, four years, five years out. But what if you, since you have the flexibility now anyway, what if you got the 20% and you only spent you didn't spend all the deferred, you spent 16 or 17 
90 some odd percent of it, whatever it is, mm -hmm. and you use the remaining amount for the financing to get the whole amount at that point. You, what you would get would be, once you add the financing, it possibly would be smaller. You would have that flexibility now, would it not be true? It's possible, you know, that given the um, market and construction, we might get a bid that would come in lower That's than, right. than what the original estimate was. So and then you could it, use the remaining amount to finance that over five years. Is that not what you're saying? That's, that's possible. But again, from, from the perspective of the superintendent trying to convince a local school board that these best case scenarios are going to happen, given what we've experienced in our economy, that's a pretty tough sell because they have to take risk to do that. And then we have to have our budget approved by the county office of education, whether That's we're right. positive or negative. Right. So that, that creates some... Do you uh, think it's a lot more difficult sell than us convincing finance to support this? No, no, no. <laughs> Thank you. I would say that we are kindred spirits in this. Okay. Um, okay, Senator Lowenthal, that was good. Uh, that was very good. Okay, we do have a motion and second on the floor to oh, approve... Ask a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, Assemblywoman uh, Brownlee, yes. Yeah, I, and uh, I understand, I mean, I clearly understand the dilemma here, but if, if we weren't going to change this particular item in terms of the tiers of flexibility, but we were going to hold it there, but within, you know, within this one categorical, we were going to slightly change statutorily, you know, the requirements, but not change it within, you know, kind of the larger spectrum. Um, by just making this one change, that school districts would all get this, we, you know, if we decided to get them all the same amount, and some school districts could use that amount, uh, you know, to finance their projects, they can choose one way or the other. They, so they would have a choice of either being able to potentially do the project or not, and use it for a reading specialist or whatever they, you know, whatever they may do. Um, so it looks like in a bipartisan way here, we're all <laughs> searching for, the, for a solution. Um, and it just, this one is just so tough because it's so hard to just have a hard and fast formula on this, that there are particular projects that we need to address sort of surgically, and we just can't, well, like, we're so close, but we can't quite get there. Um, we might have a solution for it, for that uh, that's just been called to my attention. Dr. Ellerby. Uh, I don't know if this is a solution, but uh, <laughs> Rob, we've been talking, uh, or at least the motion is on option 2A. And I was listening to Superintendent Crawford and his concern. And, and option 2B sounds more appealing to me as it relates to his issue. But if we put his issue aside, could you just briefly explain option 2A and 2B, the pluses and minuses, I know what's written, but I, I want to see which one of these options would be, say, the better to support a district that has an issue like he does. The chief difference between the two options, they're almost identical. Uh, uh, option 2B would very, in a very minute way, reduce um, the allocation under, to most districts under deferred maintenance and slightly, slightly increase the allocation to extreme hardship projects. It would be a 1% bump. It would add up to 5% over, over five years um, with the notion that it would, you know, in some way compensate for interest costs. Uh, Mr. And Cook, may, Mr. Ellerby, may I ask for a follow-up question on that? Sure. If, 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 if 2B provides an extra 1% a year, doesn't that help address the issue that Mr. Crawford raised with Senator Lowenthal about having a little bit extra to pay the financing? And if 2B is really essentially the same as 2A, except we give them a little bump, isn't that the solution we've all been looking for and it's been right in front of us? Please say yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, it is. I don't know. Was the maker of the motion Mr. Harvey or was it Ms. Fuller? Mr. Harvey. I am convinced that 2B is superior. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Harvey, Mr. Harvey, would you be willing to with, withdraw your motion? Yes, and I would then Okay, hold on. Before you make it, and I want to make sure I didn't cut Mr. Ellerby off. Was, did you have... Okay. So Mr. Harvey has withdrawn his motion, and Ms. Fuller has graciously withdrawn her second. Did well, you want... This is a bipartisan solution. I'm real excited. Did you want to make... Uh, uh, and to bring Senator Torrickson along, we, we were focusing in, Senator, on... Uh, uh, because the other options we explored required legislation. We heard testimony from the Department of Finance 
uh, representing the administration they, that they might not be willing to go along with this legislation since the budget deal had given the categorical flexibility. We'd also heard testimony from some of the districts it'd be very hard for them to take 20% of the money per year for five years because they didn't have financing costs. And we've sort of focused in on this option 2B because it actually gives them 21% of the money per year for five years, which is a higher bump, which would help address the financing in part. And so I think that's, I don't mean to brush you into a decision, Senator Torres, but I think that's sort of where we've got to. Uh, Mr. Go Harvey, to B. Mr. Go Harvey, to B. Mr. Harvey, did you want to make a motion? I move to B. I a, second that. We have a motion by Mr. Harvey, and we have a second by Dr. Ellerby. Mr. Chair? Yes. Uh, Can Assembly I just ask the superintendents if they agree that this might be helpful to them? No. No? <laughs> <laughs> uh, not, not like being put in on the spot. Um, wow. Um, I think what I, how I, I'll answer this, that question is that this is an extremely difficult economic time for all of us. And I think that if we have as a district the assurance that there's going to be a five-year payback and there's some flex in there to help us cover the financing, I believe that, that me as a superintendent, I can make it work. Okay. It's 2B is better than 2A. Uh, yes, because what I understand is that there's a little bit of bump, as the senator said, yes, and, yes. and given that there's a little bump there, and given that the construction market is as it is, that we could possibly then get a good bid, we might be able to make it work. And we don't have to accept any bid until we actually see what comes out in the wash. Okay. And, and so the other superintendent, are you w willing to comment? Thank you. I, I'm a step back from the firing line because I just work for the district. I'm not the superintendent. Oh. But I think that superintendent. You look like a superintendent. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Old enough to be. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think that uh, the problem is, and the one that we've discussed at the district is, just as Senator Hancock said, we don't know what's going to happen next year, the year after, and the year after. So assuming that we go out for financing and we get that little bit of a bump, uh, then what happens in two years or three years if the money doesn't come? And that's, that's a real issue. That's one that we've discussed at the district level. So uh, 2B is the best option that's on the table, but it still has its issues for us at the local level. Thank you. Uh, any more comments from board members? Okay, we do have a motion and a second on the floor to approve staff, staff recommendation item 2B. Uh, Ms. Jones, uh, will you call the roll, please? Sure can. Senator Lowenthal? Aye. Senator Hancock? Aye. Senator Wyland? Aye. Assemblymember Fuller? Aye. Assemblymember Brownlee? Aye. Assemblymember Torlickson? Aye. Scott Harvey? Aye. Dr. Ellerby? Aye. Rosario Gerard? Tom Sheehy? Aye. Okay, motion so, passes. So that motion has been approved. Uh, Oh, yes, Mr. Walrath. Uh, thank you. Just a couple of things. Uh, the next appropriation has already been made. It will be available in July. Is it possible at this point, since you have crafted the process by which you'll be allocating these funds, to have these apportionments made for the 8-9 money in July of 9? So the funds will start flowing a little bit faster so school districts can be putting people to work to the extent that can be done. The second is, could you ask staff? to survey districts in six months or so to find out who has not been able to start their project because of financing concerns or other concerns. So we'll have that data available to us as we try to look at potential ways of adjusting this in the future. That's a great suggestion. Rob, uh, we can do that, can't we? Uh, answer the second one, absolutely. Uh, to the first. Um, one, so long as that budget number stays static uh, that's, that's been named, we can actually do that. We can, we can do the math for that relatively simply based on, on uh, the action tonight. Uh, there is an issue with statute. It requires that we dis distribute those funds after December 1 of each year. So to the extent that we would need statutory authority to do it at an earlier date, um, we, well, we would need legislative authorization to do that at an earlier date. 
Rob, is the, uh, is the first fiscal year under which this 20% would go out the 8-9 fiscal year or the 9-10? Uh, current, it's, it's current eight, year. Nine. So, Mr. Walrath, I'm sorry, you're, you're, uh, you're asking, can the 8-9 money go out sooner? Is that what you're asking, Mr. Walrath? No, what I'm asking is that statutorily it's a December 1, but in the crafting, uh, when start, people start looking at the budget bill or trailer bills or other actions between now and July 1, if the funding stays the same, the part of the budget language allow this to go out in July rather than in December. So did the 8-9 money already go out? It is not in distributed. So uh, when th would that's the eight, this item. Yeah, when would the, well, the, the, our fiscal year is over June 30th. Mm -hmm. So is the 8-9 money going to go out before June 30th? Yes. When? As soon as we will make the, the allocation at next month's board and then we will distribute the funds thereafter. Okay, is there any way to do it sooner or does it require us to come back in another? It will require a funding item by okay. this board. All right, so we're going to get the 8-9 money out in 30 days. Now, Mr. Walbath, what you're asking is you're asking us to seek a way to get the 9-10 money out before December 1st. Correct, because that will allow the districts to have a little bit more money up front so to be able to hire people to do the deferred maintenance programs and to address some of the critical hardship issues. I'll bet you I can speak for every member on this board and say that we all support that. However, I don't know that it's uh, in our power to make that happen. It is not, but I'm doing what Tom does. I'm lobbying some of the legislative members of the board on See, I knew Tom was rubbing off on you, Mr. Walrath. Very good. Okay, thank you. Uh, what's next, Mr. Cook? Um, the next item is uh, regulations implementing Senate Bill um, 658. And uh, introduce Juan Morales to introduce that item to you. Oh, yeah, Rob, before we do that, we do have Senator Torlakson here. Uh, and since we did have one item that was still on call, we, we, we have a chance now to close that item. Senator Torlakson, we left um, item number eight, eight on call. Um, we, had a, we had a spirited discussion about it. And this item would transfer uh, $700 million from the critically overcrowded school program uh, to the new construction program, and it would also reserve $140 million uh, for three more months until our June meeting. This was That was at the request right. of Mr. Smoot. I just wanted you to know, Senator, that that item had uh, uh, eight I votes, one, was it a no or was it an abstain? It was one no vote, no. And, uh, then, and then we were just waiting for you. I vote. Okay. I vote aye. Then that item has been approved. Thank you. Sorry, Rob, go ahead. Thanks, Not a problem. One, uh, please continue. The next item <clears throat> includes amendments to the school facility program regulations in order to implement Senate Bill 658. The bill phases out the multi-track year-round education grants that are awarded by Department of Education over a four-year period and provides an exemption from the increase in school building capacity. Staff has made the necessary changes to the regulations to address the new changes in law as it relates to the new to the school facility program uh, staff has also presented the <coughs> proposed regulations to the implementation committee and has incorporated suggestions made from the stakeholders uh, with that the regulations are ready for your approval are Move there any item. okay we have a motion by uh, miss brownlee yes, we have a second any public comment on this item seeing none all in favor aye, aye. Item number 14 has been put over till next month. Item number 15, seismic mitigation. Um, at our December board, um, the board asked uh, staff to bring forward a discussion on our seismic mitigation program. Uh, there is some concern that the program hasn't been uh, blossoming as we would like and uh, that we uh, there are certain, we certainly need to do everything we can to address health and safety concerns out there, and that since the uh, um, funds were originally appropriated under Proposition 1D, we have um, we have not yet allocated any funds here. I will give you an update on, on uh, at least some good news. There have been two applications that have come into our office on on this. One is a nine million dollar. Um, replacement of a facility and then another is a five million dollar retrofit of a facility that have come in and have been judged by the division of state architect as, as eligible under the criteria. 
that's a little bit of good news. Um, I'm going to reach back a little bit in time. In 1933, there was a devastating earthquake in, in Long Beach, it was known as the Long Beach earthquake. Um, the, the best thing that happened associated with that earthquake is that it happened after school hours. As a result of that earthquake, 230 s schools collapsed in that area. And in your board item, there happens to be a photo of, a, of the damage uh, wrought at one junior high in that area. And you can clearly tell by that photo, had that school been occupied at the time, there would have been uh, death and injuries resulting from it. Um, within 30 days of, of that earthquake, the Field Act was put into place. And since 1933, the state of California has had uh, an unmatched commitment to seismic safety in its schools. Um, one of the features of the Field Act that it was that any facilities that were built prior to the Field Act had to be taken uh, either retrofit or taken out of service um, by a date in the 1970s. And since that time, every f school facility has been reviewed for every uh, for its life safety performance by the Division of the State Architect. Um, now, we, even with that, in uh, earlier in, the, uh, in this decade, AB 300 was put into place to take a, an inventory of school facilities and determine the si relative seismic safety of, of those facilities. Um, that report um, was developed by the Division of the State Architect and identified the potential for a number of facilities that might, might have been built under earlier codes that, um, as science has advanced, may be vulnerable to uh, a seismic event. Uh, in reaction to that AB 300 report, Proposition 1D allocated up to $199.5 million for seismic uh, repair, reconstruction, or replacement. That's a relatively small sum of money when you deal with facilities. Um, and that Proposition 1D further required that we take care of the most vulnerable facilities uh, of a specific type, Category 2 facilities. Um, and our task under, in developing this program is to come up with criteria that provides an opportunity for us to take care of the most vulnerable facilities within the limited funds available. Um, and the key criteria associated with that program are the facility has to be occupied by students and teachers. It has to be in a ground shaking intensity zone of 1.7 G or higher, which is, a, which is derived from U.S. Geologic, geological survey maps. It is one of four types of Category 2 construction. And a, an engineer, a structural and engineer's report has come back conclusive that the, that the facility is subject to catastrophic collapse. Those are the criteria of the program. Um, and that was focused on trying to isolate the funds on the worst, you know, t fixing the worst first. As we progressed, um, at, at the outset of, of this program and those regulations, it was assumed that approximately 77 facilities were in the pool of, elig of eligible facilities. Uh, over the last several months, the Office of Public School Construction and the Division of State Architect have done extensive outreach to school districts to try to determine whether, um, whether those facilities are still, frankly, even in some cases in existence, um, but whether how many of these facilities are actually eligible. In the course of, of that outreach, many of those, those facilities have, have fallen off, in large part due to they, at some point in the past, were already retrofit. Uh, in other cases, they've been taken out of service. And so we believe today the number of facilities that fall within the 1.7 G zone is somewhere in the neighborhood of 37 or less um, that have all the other, uh, meet all the other criteria. And, the f um, and to look at um, the policy questions that this board asked us to address, should the size, uh, the uh, ground shaking intensity factor uh, be lowered for this program. Um, should this should this program make a uh, a special grant for interim to cover interim housing costs? Should this program uh, provide a grant for the structural engineering report? 
And should this program offer an unfunded list um, for future projects that, uh, that may, uh, if, if the funds were to run out? In looking at the, um, in looking at lowering the ground, uh, uh, the ground shaking intensity factor, um, any shifts in that would obviously make more facilities eligible and uh, could help us take care of that. Setting that factor at too low a level risks um, diverting funds away from the worst facilities first and to less vulnerable facilities. Um, but adopting a change in, in that criteria is a matter of regulation and within the authority of this board. Um, as for interim housing, interim housing, as you probably know, is, uh, is while schools are open, they need to, you know, they need to be able to serve student, students. And in cases such as modernization, as some of the extreme hardship projects you've heard about tonight, students need to be displaced in order to make repairs to the facility. Interim housing is largely accom accomplished by providing portables at a site repurposing other facilities on a given site for, uh, for classroom purposes or diverting students to an alternative campus. Um, under the school facility program today, we do not provide a specific separate grant for interim housing. It is an allowable expense under the program, meaning that our grants are provided to school districts and they can apply them to those expenses, they can apply their own funds to those expenses, their eligible project costs. Uh, but we don't have a, set, have a set aside for that specific purpose. Um, with, within that, uh, in examining the policy question on interim housing, um, should, should a separate grant be set aside, it would, uh, one of the pros obviously is it assists school districts in executing these projects. Um, one, of the, one of the issues with that is it diverts funds away from, specifically from seismic repair, r r uh, reconstruction, or replacement towards these costs. Um, and according to the construct of the, of the legislative language, at least as we read it, that would need to be affected via statute. And just so happens, Senator Hancock has a bill, uh, SB 375, I believe, that takes up that issue. Um, also, uh, regarding the, the same issues apply to a structural engineering report. Uh, as you heard at our, at our last meeting, um, we've been successful with the Seismic Safety Commission in, uh, in obtaining a grant from, from that, uh, that organization in the amount of $200,000 so that we can assist districts in, in obtaining uh, structural engineering reports. But this program does not have a specific grant set aside for that type of, uh, that type of study. Um, and again, as, as the same issue with the uh, with interim housing, uh, that could be addressed legislatively. Um, uh, Rob, is that is the item number three, the funding for structural engineering reports? Is that also an SB three seventy five? That's correct. It is. I'm okay. Thank you. And finally, uh, when we get to an unfunded list, um, there are, uh, there have been districts that expressed that as they as they go through. The lengthy process of, of determining whether a facility is uh, is structurally unstable, and then developing a mitigation strategy associated with that facility, that at some point those limited funds may run out, and that they don't want to be left without uh, left without resources. And some uh, uh, some have expressed a desire to have an unfunded list established. Um, there are many liability issues that swirl around and surround this, this matter. At, uh, this particular issue was considered by the board when the original regulations were adopted. Um, there are, I, I think you can find folks on both sides of that issue for, for liability purposes. It certainly is a feature that could be implemented through regulation. I'm sorry, Robert. By this you, board. Are this, you this, board this board could adopt regulations implementing an unfunded list okay. if, it, if it so desires. So, so the item number one, which was the GSI, ground shaking intensity, and the item number four, which was the unfunded list, are both within this board's authority to act on through regulation. Mm -hmm. Item number two, which was funding for interim housing, and item number three, which was funding for engineering reports, is also something we can do, but it is your judgment we need statutory change, and we conveniently have 
Senator Hancock's SB 375, which would implement both of those. Is that an accurate summary? That is an accurate okay. summary. Questions and comments by board members? Mr. Harvey. I really appreciate this report very much because um, you articulated at the outset, Rob, this is really about health and safety, mm -hmm. making sure kids are safe in their schools. And I think the intent of the AB 300 that you alluded to back in 98, the report was issued in 02, focused on the great need. For me, um, I am comfortable moving forward on those items where we can do so by regulation. And I would like to see you bring back um, a very complete discussion on what happens if we lower that shake zone. I think you made a compelling case that when we looked at the worst of the worst, we thought there were 70 some odd buildings. Now there are only uh, 17. Of that, two have stepped forward. It seems to me, uh, given all the other criteria, you've got to have kids in it, you've got to have a local match, so forth and so on. If we broaden that somewhat, you would allow more districts to come forward. We would be able to access those dollars more quickly. We could wait the outcome on SB 375, but we've, we've by virtue of your agreement with the um, Seismic Safety Commission, also covered for those districts early in the pipeline, the ability to have that structural engineering report paid for. The only issue where we uh, put them somewhat at risk is the interim housing. Um, you've talked in terms of how that is an allowable expense. It, it's something they can put into their, their match category. Uh, we have legislation that could address it. To me, the important thing is getting these dollars out as quickly as we can We've recognized some of the obstacles. If we open up the shake zone more broadly, we will have more districts stepping forward and we address more problems. So for me, the key is liberalizing the shake zone, seeing what happens on the others. That's my spin. Thank you, Mr. Harvey. Oh. Uh, Mr. Duffy, would you like to comment on this item? I know it's of interest. We've talked about it many times. We have, and thank you, Mr. Shee, again, Tom Duffy, for, uh, for cash. Uh, I appreciate this item being on the agenda. We have, for a number of months now, going back into the fall, asked to, to have the regulations here so we could really look at them and, and talk about some changes. Um, I, I would respectfully disagree with Mr. Cook about your, your authority to deal with in the interim housing issue and the, and the other issue. If we have the... Uh, an item next month that has, as Mr. Uh, Harvey is, I think, suggesting uh, a potential for some change. I think that would be very, very positive, and we can have that discussion. Uh, this, this is an issue that continues to just sort of ebb and not really be addressed. Uh, the, the, the legislation, Mr. Harvey, that goes back to the prior decade now is uh, <coughs> this year uh, a decade old. And, and we have the AB 300 list, and, and we, we have money set aside through a bond, although limited, to be able to address something that's significant in California because we're a seismically sensitive state. And yet there seems to be, just being very direct with you, a, uh, a, a pushback because of this potentially being significant in, in terms of the fiscal implications for the state and for school districts. I, I think that it's important. You, you as a body are a very serious body. You deal with with significant issues dealing with school districts. Well, this is one of them. And one of the, the things that we frequently hear is districts don't really want to own up to having a seismically sensitive school because of the implications at the local level. Well, many of us have, have done that. In, in Ms. Hancock's district, and I think largely through uh, the outreach of uh, David Thorman, the state architect, who's very serious about this business, a school district, Piedmont, has found that it must vacate classrooms. It's done an extraordinary thing. It's gone to an adjacent district, Emory, and has contracted to use classrooms there so that they could deal with their issue because interim housing is indeed vital. You can't go in and reconstruct a building when children are in it. So the, uh, I, I don't think I have to uh, lobby or admonish you. This is serious business. We just seem to have trouble getting close to the heavy-duty discussion. We appreciate very much 
uh, Ms. Hancock's uh, willingness to, to take this issue on. And whatever we can do in regulation in terms of some substantive change, we, we'd like to do that. Therefore, we'd like to have those regs back and have an actionable item next month. And then we will uh, continue to uh, work with Ms. Hancock and the Senate and then hopefully the Assembly on, on dealing with this issue and report back to you as we make progress. But if we could take a first step at actually having the regulations before us with a potential action item, I think Ms. Moore was in support of that, that uh, notion at the last meeting two weeks ago. Uh, we'd appreciate that very much. And you've been very patient with me and with everyone, so I'll stop. But thank you very much. Thanks, Tom. But don't, don't, don't disappear. I want to have a couple of follow-ups. Um, so uh, on the issue of interim housing and structural engineering, paying for structural engineering, structural engineering reports, y you, you, you are of the opinion, or cash is of the opinion, that those can be handled through regulation and, and it doesn't require legislation? I, I believe that they, they can be, Mr. Sheehy. Various reports are done for new construction and modernization today using funds that are a combination of state and local funds. R reports and, and analyses of buildings and, and grounds uh, and, and soils are common. Okay. I'm going to respectfully request our counsel, Henry Nanjo, to report back specifically on that issue at the next meeting. I want you to look look at the code, case law, whatever you need to do uh, so we can have a further discussion on that. In the meantime, I, su I assume you're working with Senator Hancock to get her legislation passed through the Senate uh, and, uh, and on to the other House so it can then be considered there. Um, and then you've talked about the regulations. Mr. Cook did say that the ground shaking intensity factor and the unfunded list was in this board's authority through regulation. So if a majority of the members on this board would like to have those regulations come forward. I think we're in a. I think you know we're in a position to. I see a lot of heads nodding up and down. I think we're in a position to make that happen. Wasn't uh, there a motion? I'm sorry, Ms. Hancock. Mr. Was Hart. there a motion? Uh, I, I I do think I I I have no particular expertise on this issue of the ground shaking index, but I do think if this body were to act on that issue, we would want to hear from the state architect, who does have expertise in this area. And it does seem to me that before any change was made uh, in the regulations or in law regarding the GSI issue, uh, that this body would need to take some testimony here on that. Ms. Fuller. Well, I really do appreciate um, Senator Hancock's bill, and I would like to have the opportunity to um, see what it says and work on it on the legislative side, because I have three very large concerns about this, n none of which have to do with content, all of which have to do with process. One is, if we create an unfunded list, what liability we have created for the state that we have now recognized that there is a need that we can't fund. Number two is, actually it's four concerns. Number two is, uh, if there is an earthquake or some shaking and we need to change the priority of that list because some area is, is now more critical than the other areas. Um, I really don't want to be sitting on this board when all those people come down here and we have to try to dispute that. That's going to be a, a tough go. Number three is that um, these are three new um, very substantial expenses and I don't really see that they are necessarily a fee uh, nor so we could pass this and have it held up with some kind of lawsuit when we actually have Senator Hancock's bill on the way that knowing her, it's probably crafted quite well and we could avoid having 10,000 lawsuits uh, that might tie this up. And number four, um, I just personally think in times of you know cr fiscal crisis the way we are, for a board to um, take on substantial costs without a funding stream uh, is, is unwise without far more counsel than we are receiving. <laughs> so um, I, would prefer, I would prefer to, to have a legislative solution since we have one in the pipeline. Um, Ms. Fuller, if it's okay, I'd like to amplify a couple of your concerns. I'd like you to know um, uh, I share your concern about uh, the liability issue. I also share Mr. Duffy's concern, which has been expressed here by him and others regarding getting the money out the door. We do have a $200 million pot of money to address some of these 
uh, problems in schools that are in vulnerable areas, and I think it's a darn shame if we can't find a way, uh, Tom, to get that money out. I also like the idea you've suggested of having uh, this done in the context of legislation, uh, perhaps Senator Hancock's bill, because there could be more public testimony. It does seem to me that there are some serious issues on the liability, and there could very well be winners and losers with respect to the changing the ground shaking index, and I certainly don't, I, I wouldn't know how to uh, support or not support those changes without having folks that knew far more than I that could come in and give some good testimony on that. Uh, so I just want to say for the record that I, I share, uh, uh, I sh one of the goals I share with Mr. Duffy and, and with Cash and other people that are concerned about this is getting the $200 million out the door and put to productive use to make the schools that we can safer. I'd like to see that happen. But I, I do share Ms. Fuller's concern that we ought not here to act precipitously without having information. So, um, you know, Ms. Hancock's acting on a couple of these matters. Uh, per per perhaps we could find a legislative vehicle to act on the rest of them so there can be more discussion. We can also have draft regulations or have some regulations presented here to have them ready to act on at some point. Uh, but uh, I, I really do think we need to have some more discussion and testimony on the impacts of some of these changes and how it would affect the state of California in this program. Uh, Mr. Harvey? I think we have the platform to do that. I think if this is put on next month's agenda and we have the ability to discuss the two that we can control by regulation only, that would be a good start. I see the state architect is in the audience. If he's comfortable stepping forward to comment at all about his willingness to be here next month uh, to talk openly and aggressively about a recommendation on the shake zone issue because I think uh, that is an important one. There are winners and losers. I've made my statement for why I think it's a worthwhile discussion to have because we have fewer districts in the pipeline now. But Mr. Thorman, do you have anything you're comfortable saying today and would you be available next month to address that specific question? Uh, Dave Thorman, State Architect. Uh, first, let me say that I think that Rob presented very well the, the total situation. Uh, second, I, I really believe that we need to find a way to get this $200 million out there and working. We do have projects that are, are in need of this money. Uh, we're more than willing as the state architect and DSA to work with OPSC and come up with recommendations for the board for the next meeting. I, I'm sorry, Mr. Thorman. I, I heard the first part, but what was, how did you, what was your concluding comment that you, what? I'm, I'm just apologizing. The Conclu concluding comment was that I believe that we need to find a way to get this money out. And I would be more than willing with DSA to work with Rob and OPSC on adjusting the regulations so we can find a clean way to do Could that. Could you also loop in the Department of Finance staff so that they have an opportunity to take a look at what it might mean in terms of the fiscal impact? Because I know that Ms. Fuller has expressed the concern about that. I share that. There may be others. I think that would be good to have as part of the mix. Mr. Thurman? Okay, sure. Okay, thank you. Hi, could you identify yourself for the record, please? Sure. Uh, good afternoon. Margaret Brown, Assistant Superintendent for the San Ramon Valley Unified School District. And um, I'd like to say that I support <laughs> Mr. Harvey's um, motion or um, at this point in time. But, uh, and I do want to say that I do hear that the SAB is worried about liability to the state about an unfunded list. But what about the liability for school districts? You expect us to go out and complete those studies and then hold on to those reports and then do what with them? We need the unfunded list. We need the state allocation board in the state of California to help us improve the um, seismic safety of our schools. We need you to stand there with us, not just ask us to take the risk to do those studies and then hold back and, and just wait for an earthquake. So we really do need that unfunded list and we need to get the attention and hopefully get additional funding for those seismic programs. And I just think it's very, very critical that while the state is worried about liability, you know, we have great liability too in the districts and we would really appreciate that unfunded list. The other thing is um, I do believe that the state architect 
uh, Dennis Belay specifically, can help with um, the shake zone and reducing that. Initially, when we looked at the implementation of the bill um, on how to um, dole out the $199 million, the shake zone was set as, at 1.55. There was a lower number. And then as the state architect identified many more buildings and too big a list, that shake zone was raised to 1.7. So we actually have some initial numbers of how many buildings might qualify under 1.55. And that's been around for about a year now. So I think that's pretty easy to do and we should be able to do that by um, next month, but I do appreciate the idea of regulatory changes for um, an unfunded list, and um, I'm here to answer any other questions if you have any. Thank you, Thank Ms. You. Brown. Uh, please make sure the information that you were talking about with the GSI is shared with all the appropriate folks. If they don't already have it, that would be very helpful. Other questions or comments from board members? So. It sounds like the uh, the will of this board would be to have this item agendized for our next meeting uh, as an action item in case they would like to take action on regulations. Um, and uh, Rob, I want I want I want you to make sure that we have uh, that this board has the appropriate uh, staff or experts here that we have access to uh, that can testify on the questions. I'm sure board members are going to have. Uh, and, but we'll have this queued up, so if the board wants to take some action, it can. Was there any other question or comments on this item? I'm seeing none. Uh, yeah, one, one we're going to need a. We're going to need a. Do we need a motion on this, Rob? Uh, there's no need for a motion. All right, we, so you're going we'll to you're going to bring that back. Okay. Yes, Mr. Harvey. This may be a little off point, but I do know, uh, having read some reports out of Japan, that is a country that has very aggressively looked at an early shake warning system. And I don't know if there is some way of having a discussion about whether that can be folded into anything we do because it at least gives you an early alert that an earthquake is coming. You have the ability to put people in a safer position. It doesn't address the retrofit. But I don't know if there is any merit in looking at what Japan has done um, and save lives by having uh, early alert as part of what they do in schools and in their commercial settings. I'm not endorsing any product or anybody, but I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to know about that subject and whether or not that can be something we, we discuss or at least make available. <laughs> uh, Dave Thorman, let me just comment that I'm a member of the Seismic Safety Commission and I can take this to the next commission meeting. I think that's probably an appropriate place to do the research and find out the answer to your question. Mr. Thurman, if you could do that and report back to us, that would be great. Item, is it, okay, item number 16 is a report on the frequency of discussion items that have been postponed. I'm going to suggest we postpone this item <laughs> uh, since I have put that on the agenda for next time since the evening yeah. is getting late. Is there any other uh, report no, or information? That, that just gives us one more data point on the report, that's all. Yeah, is there any yeah. other uh, discussion that we need to do this, this evening, Rob? No, that, that concludes our Henry, do we have anything else we need to do? Hearing no, I none, think you're good. State, hearing no objection, the State Allocation Board is adjourned. <laughs> I, I put a fire in the belly to get this going, so you know, we don't have any action in <laughs> the next week or so. Just shoot me another email. Okay. Well, you know, if I have to go down there and scream at you. You wanted you want to let the record show that the mayor is talking about the safety of the school. You were just saying, when oh. this meeting be Oh, well, I just issued. My dad. Oh, well, that's not what I'm going to support. Uh,